check. One, two, one, two, one, two, three, four, four, three, check one, check two, three, four, four, three, two, one, one, two, one, 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 two. Check one, two, three.
check one. It's the... Yeah, but it's been happening like all day, but it's weird for me to like just move it a little bit. And how long is your talk? I'm just going to do like a little quick introduction. Okay. So um, just have a few slides to kind of like set set the set the topic. Use the handheld. Up. Yeah, I'll do yeah, that. Okay. Use that one. Perfect. That's fine. Because then we can just like pass it on to the next. Yeah. Uh, that would be, be perfect if that as long, long as that's easy. Should we, should we stay somewhere? I don't know how you do this with. The no, um, they can. That camera can move. I mean, I think. Try to stay within this. Yeah. yeah so like. Yeah. Um, just this like general area. Okay. But if you need to move around, you can kind of adjust. And then <laughs> yeah. Test one, two. Okay. Hi, welcome everyone. It's 2 p.m. now, so I feel like we should start so that we actually get through the three hours that we have ahead of us. And the three hours really are on Earth system software, Earth system models that we, as least like many of us, build in Julia. And I feel like there was a definitely a very good opportunity to get people here together to kind of talk about this idea of like how do we actually build these software and can we somehow come up with like a certain let's say like certain way of how we do this especially like given that Julia has a couple of different programming features that other for, uh, languages like let's say Fortran for example don't and uh, so we really want to dive deep into this idea of what is the anatomy of our models that we built and so that's why we came up with these like Phoenix or Cyborg. And I feel like I got a couple of questions on that. So just to quite quick, quickly explain this, it's really this idea that if you have an existing Phoenix, let's say a Fortran model, and then you say like Fortran is dead, let's do something else, let's do Julia, but you actually just replicate the same concepts that you already have written in Fortran. And so basically the Phoenix is just reborn from its ashes. And then on the other hand, you have the Cyborg, where you say you have an existing model, but actually you can enhance it with new features that are not human, but that are some kind of new machinery. And so this is where the cyborg comes in. And I hope we basically all realize that we're building not just, we're not just creating phoenixes, but we're actually creating cyborgs. Um, exactly, so we have a couple of uh, speakers coming up in the next, uh, over the next three hours. We'll have a quick break in between. Um, but in order to set the scene, I feel like what we probably all kind of started to agree on is that if you think about this space of on the x-axis, you have some kind of user as well as, and this is what I find very important, uh, developer friendliness. So how easy is it to use your model, but also how easy is it to extend it? 
uh, to kind of hack around with it, to kind of do something with it. And on the y-axis, you have something like performance. And I feel like our current state of um, uh, climate model or Earth system model development is kind of like twofold in a way where a lot of people use Python for the easy stuff uh, because it's easy, you can easily write something down. Um, you can obviously use other high-level languages that you want, but just as an example, Python. But you may then end up with a rather slow code. And then on the other, other hand, like the really old school models uh, are written in Fortran, which are way more difficult to use, way more def difficult to extend. Uh, but we have used them because they were fast. And nowadays, obviously, there's been a lot of people that try to kind of like gap, uh, bridge this, this gap in between. So you have maybe like a Python interface to a Fortran model, but in the end, you're kind of just like moving up and down on this, on this diagonal. And I feel like with Julia, there is absolutely the, um, the opportunity to explore this top left corner. I mean, no one really wants to be in the top bottom right corner, but in the top left corner, definitely there's an opportunity for Julia. And this is only part of this space. And I feel another part of this space is where you replace the y-axis, not with performance, but with software complexity. So obviously there's like very large models uh, written in, or like very large uh, software written in Python. Uh, but I feel like because of this like fast, slow issue, people have basically said like, well, let's do it in Fortran because we don't know if we build something that big, if we actually build it in Python, whether we could, uh, whether we could have ever reach the performance that is necessary. And so here again, I feel like there's absolutely an, uh, an opportunity for Julia to be in the top left corner and especially when it comes to really big models and not just like a couple of lines of code, hey, this is how we can write this really easily in, in Julia, but if we actually end up building really big models. Um, and so I hope in the next few hours we'll get some answers on that, uh, how we can kind of like maybe even come up like conceptually with something like a blueprint of like how do we write this software uh, so that we uh, guarantee uh, that we always end up in this like top, top uh, left corner there. So exactly how, and I feel this is, one of the things that our community can definitely tackle in the, in the coming years is how do we build complex earth system software that is easy to develop and use, but it is also fast at the same time because our current models aren't, and I feel we can shake this whole space there a little bit. Um, so uh, we're currently at the intro, then we're gonna hear uh, Greg after that Scala. I will talk a little bit then Julia will have at the moment scheduled a break for 10 minutes because otherwise three hours are a bit long. Um, and then the second part will start with Sarah. Uh, Lisa Reynolds unfortunately had a canceled flight. So we will somehow like um, uh, allow people to have a little bit more time. So don't be too stressed if you run a few minutes over. That should be absolutely fine. And then at the end, we really want to have a little bit more of overflow discussion time as well as an outro where I feel like we should absolutely discuss like what could the, be the next step what could the next steps be um, in terms of like, do we have something like a, like a monthly meeting or so where people come together in order to kind of keep this community alive and kind of bring us forward so that we can say like, hey, Julia is not just like a niche language, but actually we can uh, do a much better job with it and we can solve problems that people that are still stuck in the Fortran world think are impossible to solve. Great, and so I think this is where I would like to stop with this introduction and then hand over to Greg. Yeah. We're already ahead of time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, meaning I should uh, give you a very, very long introduction. <laughs> no, I'm an no. Okay, so this is Greg Wagner. Um, I need no introduction. You need no, okay. <laughs> Someone who needs no introduction. <laughs> Um, maybe the one of the maybe the mastermind behind Oceanenigans, and so he's going to talk about surprise Oceanenigans, <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, yeah, how to make things fast on GPUs, ocean flavored, not just ocean fluid dynamics, but ocean flavored fluid dynamics. I am actually not going to talk too much about GPUs, although it's just sort of a given that we run on GPUs. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, as Milan said, I'm I'm Greg Wagner. Um, I'm a research scientist at MIT. Uh, I'm working on this uh, Climate Modeling Alliance project to develop a new climate model, a uh, trainable climate model. Um, and at MIT, we work on the ocean component. Um, 
with some help from Julia Lab. Uh, so this talk, so this talk I have, there's two main parts. One, I'm just going to um, give you a uh, brief introduction to O'Shannigans um, and explain what we can do and how we do it. And then I'll, the second part of the talk, I'll try to dive a little bit deeper and I'll discuss one aspect of the abstractions that we use, um, which allow us to, which are you know, a core part of our user interface and our software design. So Oceananigans is the ocean component of um, what is, the, of Klima's trainable climate model, which is currently under development. Um, and so, you, you know, I, there's a diagram of an Earth system model over on the right, left, right side. Um, and the ocean is just one tiny component of the very big and complex Earth system model. Um, but it's important. Um, and I think what the way our philosophy, like what Oceananigans is fundamentally, um, is the way we think about it is that it's a library for uh, building or coding simulations of idealized and realistic fluid dynamic scenarios. So um, a user of Oceananigans is a programmer who writes a script that implements a numerical simulation. Um, and I think that's a little bit of a different philosophy than many ocean models have been, than, that many ocean models use. Um, for example, um, other, you know, a, a traditional ocean model written in Fortran is gonna think of the user as someone who passes a configuration file to, um, to sort of a black box that then spits out the data at the end. Um, but in Oceanians we, Oceanians, we try to reveal more of the innards to give users more flexibility. Um, and also make scripts um, clearer, like more clearly represent um, the numerical experiments that um, are being implemented. So, you know, our, our goal is both to make the science more reproducible and easier, easier to learn, to shorten that learning curve, um, and also to make um, more complex simulations, complex simulations in creative science possible. Um, in terms of uh, like the nuts and bolts of Oceanigans, you can kind of, if you're familiar with the MIT GCM, which was developed at MIT, um, it's very, the numerics and the internal, you know, you know the, the numerical methods that we use are similar to the ones that MIT GCM uses. Um, what Oceanigans adds, the primary thing that it adds is that we run on GPUs, which makes us very fast and efficient. Um, and so the reason why you should care about Oceanigans, other than the fact that it's written in Julia, which is probably why you're here in the first place, um, so maybe it doesn't even matter, but um, we find that Oceanigans is very fast and efficient. So it allows you to run large problems with minimal resources. Um, and that's because we use the GPU and also some of the, um, through careful code design. And then the other reason to care about Oceanigans is that it's friendly, so it's easy to use and it's flexible, So I was saying. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so I'll just give a, I'll give a very brief tutorial to Oceanigans first to start out. Um, and this is from the, this example is taken from the Oceanigans README. So, um, in the, in the block of code, there are seven lines. And what these seven lines do is they set up a, uh, a, a simulation of freely decaying turbulence initialized with a random velocity field that runs, it's non-dimensional, so it runs for four time units. Um, and so uh, this illustrates, so I think one of the things that we wanted to illustrate here is how, um, how we, ha um, what the type hierarchies are in our code. So this sort of illustrates a type hi hierarchy in Oceanigans. Uh, the end point of an Oceanigans script is the simulation, um, which, you know, a typical Oceanigans script will have a run simulation um, towards the end. Um, and a simulation is, is built, it's, a, it's built in terms of a model which represents um, a continuous set of equations that um, is the basis for um, the fluid dynamics model. So in this case, we're using a non-hydrostatic incompressible model for fluid dynamics. Um, and then the model depends on um, a grid which represents the physical domain in which the simulation is being um, um, run. And so then the last line, you see that um, there's a little comment at the end. Um, so this simulation is set up to run on the CPU, but um, what the way, in terms of the user inter, the way that we've built hardware agnosticism into the user interface, in other words, the way that we allow users to switch from the CPU to GPU is by changing 
um, the first argument to the grid. So that's in principle, and for simple setups, that's all you would have to change um, in order to run on the GPU. And that's the making that switch from the CPU to the GPU easy is an important element of our software design because we believe that you know the, the uh, an efficient workflow for setting up um, sim like big simulations is to prototype things, get things set up rapidly on your laptop, and then increase the resolution and run on the GPU or multiple GPUs. <clears throat> oh, yeah, that's what I said. Okay, so another core aspect of Oceanian's design is a system for um, computing diagnostics that are a function of the, of, of the data of the model. Um, so here I'm illustrating how you would compute something called vorticity from the model velocities from this simulation that was just run. Um, and um, I guess the main point here is just that um, we've, tried to, we've tried to design it so that users who are, who are uh, physical scientists can use a syntax that resembles the math, um, the math that they know uh, to, to write code. Um, and that's another, you know, that's another important feature of Ocean Anigan's ease of use. Okay, so that's, that's an end to the tutorial. Okay, so, um, I just wanna run. So, another, um, another thing that we're proud of in Ocean Anigan's is that we're relatively flexible compared to other ocean models. So, um, at the example I just showed you is the one on the left, which I would I say that's a classroom example or a simple idealized example that you could use in the teaching environment um, or just to, um, to teach Oceanigans. Um, we also support a type of numerical simulation that you could regard, you could call small scale process studies. So these are simulations that are meant to reproduce laboratory experiments. Um, or represent a limited area of the ocean at a high fidelity. Um, so we're studying a particular ocean process rather than the whole ocean. And then in addition to that, we also support uh, global ocean modeling, um, although that's kind of the thing that we're still um, working on right now. Um, so that's sort of a work in progress, I'd say. Um, but, but so that's a, another thing that we're proud of in Ocean Anigans is that we allow users to um, it, with one software ecosystem, we can um, we allow users to study a wide range um, of physical scenarios. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into um, into the user interface and also the innards of Ocean Anigans to try to explain um, well how we I think that we achieve uh, ease of use and also um, we have a how our software design, uh, how we achieve extensibility and modularity in our software design. Um, so the core, one, one of the core elements of any numerical experiment is something that we call the model, um, which loosely speaking represents, um, it, you could think of the, the basis for a model is a partial differential equation. So in this case, I'm, I have an example um, with the, our hydrostatic free surface model. Ocean Anigans has three different models that we support. Um, in the hydrostatic free surface model, one of the equations that it solves is the one at the bottom, which is the Navier, um, hydrostatic Navier-Stokes equations. This is for horizontal momentum, what I'm showing. Um, so Oceaning is user, the, the interface for setting up a model. Uh, when you set up a model, um, you, you, sorry, let me reset. So the way that a user sets up a model is they specify keyword arguments in the model constructor. And um, the way that you might think about it is that each keyword argument represents a term in, the, in this um, equation which represents um, the, the, physics, the physics of the problem. So um, in this example, I'm showing uh, a model constructor that has three, where the user has configured three terms in this hydrostatic momentum equation. They've, they've configured the advection term. So in this case, they're specifying a numerical scheme for the advection term. They've configured a Coriolis term, which is in green. Um, and so in, that, in this case, um, the Coriolis keyword argument, it determines not only the numerics, but also the physical meaning of the term. Um, and then they've also specified a closure term, um, which is sort of a catch-all phrase for all of the other stuff um, that enters the model in addition to the other um, five terms there. Um, and so, and so, 
this, this, is, uh, this, this is how we achieve modularity because users can um, change the um, behavior of each term independent from one another. So they can keep one momentum advection term but change the Coriolis term. They can keep the momentum and, and Coriolis fix and change the closure. Okay, so under the hood, okay, so now let's go under the hood a little bit more. Um, so that's, that's the user perspective of how a model is configured. Now, under the hood, um, the, most expensive, um, the most expensive calculation that we do um, in the course of taking a time step of the model is to evaluate the tendency, which is the right-hand side, a, a discrete representation of the right-hand side of the equation below. And so um, those keyword arguments that I showed map one-to-one -to, -one to terms in the source code um, that calculate the contribution of each of these terms to the tendency. Um, so I, I think, yeah. So this, is, this sort of shows how the user input is changing the content, um, the, the, con the, the computation um, underneath. Um, and I guess, okay, so what I'm, what I'm hoping to illustrate um, by showing you the source code is, um, how this achieves extensibility. So say now that I, I'm interested, um, o, I'm, o Shenanigans does not support a particular type of closure um, that I would like to implement. Um, in order to implement a new closure in O Shenanigans, this, um, you know, in the Julia way, this requires um, developing a new closure type. So here, for example, I, the, the type of the closure is horizontal scale diffusivity. If I want to develop a new closure, I implement a new type, and then I extend those two methods in red um, in order to implement a new contribution to the tendency associated with that closure. Um, so, this, so this slide illustrates, in a nutshell, how you would do that. Um, in addition to, you know, in addition to just, you don't, so the, there's, a, there's sort of a, um, there's a hierarchy of ways that you might um, insert yourself into Oceanigans. One could be to simply redefine that function dj tau 1j, for example. That's the contribution of the uh, closure to the u component of the equations. Or you can also leverage um, some abstract types that we have, some internal abstract types that um, capture common patterns for in, in closures that people um, are interested in implementing. For example, one abstract type we have represents a scalar diffusivity, so that's a diffusion is a is a is a very common type of closure that people are interested in um, simulating or using, um, and so if you're if you're going to implement a diffusive closure, then you have you can write a lot less code um, in order to extend O shenanigans, and then so you know I, as I was saying, the writing a new closure involves implementing this type my new parameterization. And then in order to use it in the model, as long as you've extended all the methods properly, you don't have to do this within the Oceaning and source code. You could do this anywhere you want in your own script, for example. Um, then you simply pass your closure into a model and it should, if there's no bugs, it should work. Um, okay, so I think I'm on time. Um, Okay, so what's next with Oceanigans? I think, uh, so right now, Oceanigans is, is mature for doing um, both the classroom examples, it excels at that, um, and it's also mature for doing small scale problems, these process studies. Um, but the thing that we're working on right now is building um, maturity in our uh, capability for global ocean modeling. And in particular, we're interested in doing high, res high resolution modeling on multiple GPUs, that's because um, we found so the 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 figure on the bottom left is showing um, the uh, efficiency of Oceanigans in terms of this metric simulated years per milliwatt hour. Um, so that's how many how much energy it takes to simulate a year um, of ocean turbulence, basically. Um, and it illustrates that Oceanigans is, ex is exceeding the state of the art. So I think um, we are trying to argue that we haven't just achieved you know writing a new ocean model in Julia, but we've actually achieved We've, we've exceeded the state of the art in terms of performance and efficiency, um, which would be important no matter what language we were using or regardless of how easy it, to use it was. Um, and then after that, the next step, of course, is to couple with the other components of Klima and train 
a climate model, like a neural network. Okay, thank you. Why is it so efficient? Yeah, so we so we we have theories for why, but we don't have you know we can't prove um, the reason. We O'Shannigan's one of the, one of the I don't know if you were there for um, Simon's talk about porting from CPU to GPU um, earlier today, um, but I guess I asked this question: um, Is it important to optimize on the CPU before you port to GPU? Um, in Oceanigans, we didn't. We've never optimized for the CPU. We focused completely on the GPU from the beginning, um, and I guess it's our impression that many other models. So Veros is not Veros. Is, I wouldn't regard Veros as like a mature ocean model. It's like a sort of an experimental ocean model that's written in JAX, um, and it achieves good performance as well. It's written for GPU too. Um, Oceanigans is written in Julia. Um, Julia's probably, like the way that we've written the code is better suited for high performance than using JAX, for example, which you have to make some compromises, so that's why we might be better than Veros. Um, and in terms of the other models, I think because we focus on GPU from the beginning, memory efficiency and um, GPU specific performance, maybe that's why. No, I don't think, I think Julia is, um, I don't think, I don't think Julia makes it more performant intrinsically. I think it makes it easier to develop a performant model. Um, yeah, well, you know, given teams of the same size and the same resources devoted to the problem, that would be the case, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, Oceanigans. Every the numerical algorithms require orthogonal grids. Um, so everything it's a finite volume method for disc. We use finite volume methods to discretize partial differential equations, and that's what we do at, at our core. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, wasn't what? What was the word you used? You said. Ah, uh, we we assume quadrilaterals. Yeah. We support CUDA, but people are working on AMD as well. Um, yeah, you could ask Chris and Ballantin about that. And maybe other people here actually too that I don't haven't met yet. <laughs> Say what? Yeah, so uh, Oceanigans, we use kernel abstractions under the hood. That's um, how we achieve hardware agnosticism. And um, so, it, Kernel abstraction supports AMD GPU, and then there's a little bit of extra work that we have to do um, to make all of Oceanigans support AMD. But that, that is a work in progress that I think is probably pretty close. Mm. <laughs> probably. <laughs> Let's thank Greg once more. And our next speaker will give it a second. We had this problem earlier. It's not you. <laughs> <laughs>
Or is that just unplugging here and then plug it back in? Yeah, amazing. Um, now we're going to the next talk, and we're going from the ocean to sea ice. Um, and this is uh, Scala from Caltech presenting on subzero.jl. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. So yeah, my name is Skylar. I'm a research software engineer at Caltech in Dr. Andy Thompson's lab. And so today I'm going to be talking to you about subzero.jl, which is a not yet released, but in the future soon to be released package for discrete element sea ice modeling. Uh, which I'll go into what that is a bit more in a second. Uh, and this talk is going to kind of have three stages. The first talk is just what is discrete element sea ice modeling? What is this model sub-zero? And then our successes and challenges on moving what was originally a MATLAB model into Julia. And so jumping into the background, I'm going to start by sort of introducing the team that I work with. So I work with uh, Andy Thompson and Mukund Gupta at Caltech. They're my advisors on this project. And then Mukund and I are co-mentoring Rohais Harris, who is an undergraduate from Georgia Tech using subzero.jl to start performing some real science. And the original authors of the model in MATLAB are Georgi Manacharian and Brandon Montemuro at University of Washington. And all of this is funded under a multi-university research initiative from ONR, uh, which is Mathematics and Data Science for Improved Physical Modeling and Prediction of Sea Ice. So from that background, and kudos to my lovely team, uh, so why are we looking at discrete element sea ice modeling? Uh, as you may know, we're losing ice. So this is the Arctic sea ice extent from 1980 to 2020. We have this sharp downward gradient. It's not looking good. Uh, but the thing is, is we're not actually losing ice everywhere in the sea ice pack equally. We're losing ice around the edges of the pack, which you can see in the more colorful figure in the dark blue around the edges. And these edge zones, sort of where the sea ice pack meets the ocean, are what's called the marginal ice zone. And in this marginal ice zone, it's not actually one big sheet of ice. What we see are individual ice flows. That's F-L-O-E. And so I'm going to use that word a lot, and I mean ice pieces. Uh, and basically, the amount at which these ice flows look like individual chunks versus a big pack sort of depend on seasonality and conditions. But in this marginal ice zone is where we see the highest occurrence of individual flows. And so the question is, is, does this looking completely different from one big ice sheet, which is what's represented in most big climate models, does that impact dynamics in these critically important regions which have the most melting? And so that's really where discrete element sea ice models come in, which represent each flow individually in order to study dynamics. And so this is the model that we're working with. This is sub-zero. And basically what sub-zero does is every ice flow is a polygon. We can have convex or concave, and in the top you can see different configurations with different uh, percentages of sea ice, 30, 90, 100, and in this little cutout, uh, you can see both convex and concave flows. And the other thing about sub-zero is that these flows actually change size and we change magnitude of flows throughout the run. So depending on conditions, flows that are overlapping and interacting can meld together through welding. Uh, overlapped areas can sort of be transferred to one flow or another, and if put under enough stress, the ice will crack and split into multiple new flows. And again, this was written originally in MATLAB uh, by Georgi and Brandon. And so with that background, I want to show you a simulation run by Sub-Zero. And so I want you to first focus on this panel that is closer to me. I'm just going to play this and talk through. And so this is the Nares Strait, which is an important channel for sea ice transport. And it's quite narrow. And so the thing is, is that in global climate models, this isn't resolved well because it's one or two, three grid cells, especially in width. But the thing is, is this is actually critically important for the state of Arctic sea ice. And so what we're seeing here is a downward flow pushing these individual ice flows downward. They're cracking uh, as they move throughout the straight. So let you guys see that for a second. And I'm going to play this one more time, and I want you to focus on the other side. And what you can see here is there are actually four small islands. So there's three right here and one up here. And that is actually the correct 
uh, formations that are in the actual Nares Strait. And so this actually allows us to look at it, how these four perhaps seemingly inconsequential islands give us a new idea of how ice dynamics work. And we can see that this actually causes the ice flow to move much slower throughout the strait. So this is the type of experiments that uh, people are starting to do with Sub-Zero. And Georgi and Brandon are actually busy comparing this to satellite imagery so we can assess the performance of the model with an eye towards realism. Yeah. So I'll just let that finish and then we'll move on. Okay, fantastic. So with, oh, let me move forward. Okay, so with that, that's sort of the model in MATLAB and we've been working for a year on translating it to Julia and our eye for translating it to Julia is threefold. So the first is really performance. The, as you can imagine, this is a rather costly model representing all the individual flows. And so in, in, improving performance will allow us to run bigger, more complex experiments. The other is coupling. A uh, big reason we wanna look at this is how do we know how, um, we wanna look deeper at how the ocean affects the ice, but also how the ice affects the ocean and eventually the atmosphere. And then finally, it's just an eye towards making this more open source, moving away from MATLAB, um, and also just making the model more usable for scientists in general. And so this is sort of how we're doing on these three fronts. Uh, performance is definitely improving. So, <laughs> so this is a shear flow simulation, which basically means that at the 50 kilometer mark, right through the middle, we have 0.5 meter per second flow, and then a gradient up to zero meters per second at the top and bottom, pushing ice flows. And here we have performance MATLAB versus Julia in minutes. Uh, sorry, flip the axes, my bad. Uh, we have 25, 50, 100, 200, and 400 flows, and we're actually seeing improvements of up to 25 times speed up. And this is through a combination of just the straight translation and then profiling the code through memory uh, and speed profilers and just sort of picking off the low-hanging fruit. And we're confident we can actually get more performance out of this model. So this is already a huge win. Uh, the other thing is coupling. So we've been working on coupling with Oceanigans, which you just heard about. We've successfully coupled both one-way and two-way with Oceanigans, which means one-way is the ocean affecting the ice, and two-way is ocean affecting ice, but also ice affecting the ocean. And so we're working on that. This is a one-way coupled uh, GIF, but we're uh, running preliminary experiments now. And the next step could potentially be to couple to an atmospheric GCM, perhaps Klima Atmos, um, in the future. And then there's potential discussion of making this coupling more streamlined for future users, uh, trying to take advantage of the coupling framework that's being set up within Klima. And then uh, just a quick touch on the coupling, sort of the way that we're doing this is it has to be grid cell by grid cell. And our eye is to make this precise because we really want to study how exactly ice flow and ice movement is affecting the ocean. And so basically we have what we're calling subflow points, uh, at least one per grid cell. It's sort of up to users how to define. And we have several schemes for defining subflow points based on user wants and more could be extended. Uh, and then through that, we're able to uh, calculate the stresses ice to ocean and ocean to ice and pass that into Oceanigans as a field to continue our runs. Uh, and then the other big win is just distribution. So in the switch to MATLAB, there's been significant code redesign and we've really taken inspiration from Oceanigans setup of having a simulation which holds a model, holding all the sort of necessary components for a run physical constants, output writers outside the simulation. And so this has really led to increased modularity and really multiple dispatch has been a huge win here. Um, in, initial, in, a, in original Sub-Zero in MATLAB, to make a new simulation with different boundaries, uh, we actually had people had different versions of the model entirely saved with different boundaries or huge chunks of code and multiple files that needed to be commented in and out just to make these changes. But here, through multiple dispatch, uh, a lot of the switches to make different types of runs just become seamless. It's a huge win for us in Julia. And we're planning a release of subzero.jl sometime in the future. Uh, now onto the challenges. Uh, and the two that I really want to touch on are the geometry environment and sort of the state of that in Julia at this time, and also a parallelization strategy. So choosing the best option for our evolving discrete elements, is, these are things we're working towards in the next year. Uh, so the first is, Geometry is kind of tricky in Julia, actually. Um, and the library we use right now is called libgeos, which is just a wrapper for geos, um, C-A-P-I. 
Uh, and we picked this because it's really robust. It has all the functionality that we needed, which after scrolling through pages of Julia geometry libraries wasn't something that was readily available in other libraries, just because it is a new language, so we don't have that robustness that things like Python have. But through further use, you kind of find out mm, this isn't quite type stable and it's leading to quite a lot of excess allocations. And this is not to shame libgeo's type stability in geometry is quite hard. Because if you pass two polygons to an intersection function, you can get any number of outputs. Another polygon, a line, a point, nothing, a multi-polygon. And this is quite difficult for Julia to handle without you know, code-worn type going crazy. Um, and the other is sort of excess allocations, and this is more because it's a C library and dealing with pointers and these polygon objects, and we're dealing with coordinates, and it turns out that these polygon objects are uh, not quite thread safe. So this leads to excess allocations at the moment, and so we're really looking to move away from uh, libgeos. And as sort of a show of how much we think this will actually improve performance further, this is a memory allocation. If you all look at this huge yellow line in the middle right here, that's for making polygons to pass them to these functions. So once we're able to get away from that, which is, as of profiling, one of our number one priorities, we expect a further speed up. Uh, and so finally, on the geometry side, this sort of my confusion at what to do in this geometry led to a conversation on the Slack channel. Shout out to the lovely people in the geometry channel. As you can see, this led to an almost 100 reply chain of messages with me saying, hi, all these bullet points are libraries that I've considered using. None of them are quite right. And everyone was like, that, that is very true. Um, <laughs> which felt very vindicating. And so we've started this new library called geometryops.jl. And so the idea is to unify these different packages, uh, hopefully sort of unify the geometry community to put all the wonderful methods that are spread across 20 different packages into one package, make it what's called geo interface, which is something in the geometry community to allow sort of different types of shapes uh, built in different ways to work with the same functionality. And we're focusing primarily on 2 and 2.5D geometry. So if anyone loves geometry, uh, hit us up because we're slowly starting development on that. And then the other big thing that I want to touch on is parallelization strategy. And so the question here is, what's best for this type of problem? Uh, Multi-threading or distributed? And right now we have multi-threading over both flows and grid cells, sort of depending on the computation that we're doing at the time. And this has advantages in that a lot of these computations are sort of flow by flow. You know, we're moving individual flows. But we have this problem that many computations, such as merging two flows, affect two flows at once. And multiple flows can be affecting multiple other flows. And so we're having to jump out from parallelized to serial all the time. So that sort of leads to, ah, oh, distributed, great. Flows that inter interact with one another are close to one another. But the problem is, is we have these flows that will inevitably cross over these regions. And because they are, in fact, one object, they need to maintain very close communication. We can't have them moving in different directions. And so this leads to, perhaps, uh, I'm not super uh, well versed in this, and so I welcome feedback. Uh, this seems like it could present a problem. And so basically, we are looking to redesign this parallelization scheme to continue to optimize performance and would welcome feedback. And that sort of leads into our other question. Right now, we're on CPUs, but obviously, we couple with O'Shenanigans, which is on GPUs. And so we were wondering if that might be something that would be well suited to this problem. And it's something we've started researching, but would welcome feedback on either of these points. So thank you. Yeah, so there's a couple of... I think you could probably repeat the question, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So the question was sort of how do you set up the ice flow field? Do you pick a random assortment of polygons? Um, there's two sort of ways to initialize a field. That is sort of one of them, but what we use is called Voronoi tessellation. And so basically it will fill an empty space with a subset of polygons sort of filling the whole space. Um, there's also the option for those different percentage fullness, and by doing that, we just sort of remove elements from the Voronoi tessellation. Uh, you also can read in flows from a file. So if you had perhaps, let's say, a satellite image that you wanted to model and you could use um, um, computer vision techniques to sort of get the coordinates, that could easily be read in and simulated. Uh, yes? Uh, Correct. Yes, yeah, so we are 2D. There is um, functionality for ridging and rafting um, 
in the original, which basically says that if they overlap to in a certain amount, we just sort of prescribe that overlap area to one flow or the other, and then adjust the height of the flow to match, sort of to keep the uh, mass balanced. Yeah, and that is not currently in the Julia, but it is in progress in the translation. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. No, no, continue. Um, Not yet, not yet. It's definitely a consideration of how much we want to take into account height in the future, um, and it's a, it's an open conversation. Yes, yes, and that's something sort of right now we have a very basic coupling scheme where we, uh, in, a, you know, in a for loop, we take a couple of step, time steps of our model, we take a couple of time steps of our shenanigans, and we pass basically right now just the stress field back and forth, uh, and that'll, it, we're gonna increase the amount of field, so there'll be temperature and salinity and those sorts of things uh, as coupling progresses, but yes, right now, that is sort of how we're doing it. Correct. Which, if I understood you correctly, would also suddenly drastically increase the computational demand for this. Correct. Method. Yes. So, how do you know if you, let's say, start with a certain flow distribution, you cut play in the model, how do you know how many flows are you going to produce and therefore, like, how much, how long your model is basically going to run in, in, in the future? Or is there basically at some point a hard cap that you say, like, we want to be able to simulate this and Yeah, uh, one of the banes of my existence is the lack of knowledge of how many flows you're gonna have. Uh, and so that's sort of an open question when you started. I mean, you can make guesses sort of based on, you can pick different fracture criteria and set different parameters, and this will affect how quickly everything is fracturing. Um, and there is also a lot of settings. So for example, minimum flow size, at which point flows will be deleted, that way you're not, uh, you know, modeling infinitesimally tiny flows and just slowing everything down. But that is a problem we're grappling with, and that's something I actually grapple with a lot with saving data, never knowing exactly how much I'm going to need and non-square matrices and all of these problems. So another open challenge. Yeah. Yeah, that's on. That's on. No, it's on. Yeah. Uh, it's on. Now, now it's on? Ah, okay, so it's, it's just on for the, okay, now it's just on for the last speaker. Um, yeah, I guess then it's also really the problem if you go onto GPUs because you don't necessarily know how much memory you already have to allocate. Yes, and yeah. Yes, pre-allocation becomes quite tricky. That's something you sort of, I'm, I'm thinking about in ways to decrease memory usage because you never at any given time step know exactly how many flows you have. And there's both increasing numbers of flows, but also you lose flows every time step due to various things, so it's tricky. Very tricky. Uh, do we have another question? Flows only created by fracturing, or also can they be like spontaneously formed? Out of the ocean? Yeah, so with the right thermodynamic conditions, they can be spontaneously formed. Um, that's another feature that's still being moved from MATLAB into Julia. But the idea there is very similar to the Voronoi tessellation. So you'll just re tessellate open areas um, with the right thermodynamic conditions, and then they'll have a very low height to sort of represent brand new ice. Oh, and then height like can sometimes grow. Yeah, height can increase or decrease based on thermodynamic conditions. So you'll see that growth. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Um, wh what were the easiest and hardest parts of translating from MATLAB to Julia? I mean, I think the actual translation of like particular functions is not too tricky because, I mean, the great thing is they're both one indexed. So that's one problem. <laughs> 
this is one problem where you don't get lots of little bugs in the indexing at least. Um, but I think the hard part is, is there is that desire just to do the direct translation because it can work, but the structure needs to be completely different to have performant code. So it's sort of fighting that urge for speed versus speed of translation versus quality and performance of code. Yeah. Amazing. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Skylar, for presenting. Um, I got you. <laughs> Maybe it's the same problem again. I was just unplugging here and plugging it back in. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Um, then we come to the next talk. Um, and I'm going to present on speedyweather.jl, which is a model that I've been working on for, let's say, like the last year or so. There's a couple of, uh, actually, quite a lot of uh, contributors that have contributed different amounts in different ways. Uh, some of them conceptually, some of them have uh, written entire schemes for it. Um, and speedyweather.jl a, has a slightly different approach in the sense that it is not supposed to be like I do not necessarily see it as like really being like a full-blown atmospheric model, but it's more I always see it as like a, a computational research playground. So really more on the side of like being a little bit um, simpler and therefore not necessarily always uh, being like, I don't know, uh, highly tuned in order to represent certain um, climate or atmospheric processes very well, but really basically being just like a playground of like, how can we actually create something like a um, relatively easy, usable climate model in Julia um, that is also customizable and composable, which Greg already talked about, and you will definitely, yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot of inspiration from Oceanagans that went into speedyweather.jl. Um, but my, really my initial motivation for this was um, when I probably saw pictures like these ones, which uh, I think is, a, is a, from, from a Twitter, uh, from a tweet uh, from AGU at some point where someone built a hurricane in Lego. And I feel like every time I try to explain people what, um, what speedy weather is supposed to be like, I somehow use the word Lego in it because I feel like I want to be able to have a model where you can literally, as easy as in Lego, you can kind of just like take out certain parts and put in new parts, right? So if you ask a five-year-old here now, like what would a hurricane look like without precipitation, they would probably just take away the blue pieces. Um, and this is exactly how easy I want a climate model or like an atmospheric model in this case uh, to be. So that in the end, what you, the only thing you really have to define are the interfaces, right? So like the little, the kind of like the little nibbles that stick out and the other parts of the Lego pieces in order to like get them together. But you can actually, um, if, if you wanted to, you could replace the blue Lego pieces with like purple uh, um, Lego pieces representing, I don't know, ice instead of, uh, uh, instead of, instead of water, for example, right? Um, and so, at the moment, speedyweather.jl is at a stage where you can uh, like play that video, um, is at a stage where you can run the primitive dry core and wet core um, on the globe. It uses spherical harmonics to, to discretize um, the equations of motions. Uh, and so we're in, comp in contrast to uh, many of the other models that we've heard, or like the, especially with Anagans, we cannot run a, just a, a specific region. We always have to use the entire globe because of the spherical harmonics. Um, um, but also there's a, definitely a focus at the moment on the atmosphere. For example, here you can see that there's not really an imprint of the ocean on your uh, surface temperatures. So these are surface temperatures. Um, you can see mountains, yeah, but you can't see the ocean. This is simply because the, the um, heat fluxes with the ocean are just not implemented at the moment. And so this is where, yeah, basically you have kind of filled up the entire ocean with concrete or something like this. Um, and so in order to kind of like present a little bit, I'm going to do some live coding. Um, 
how that, I'm gonna make it a bit bigger, um, how you use speedy weather is it's very, very similar. I kind of definitely took a lot of inspiration there from Motion Edigan, where you exactly, you, like once you load the package, I, let's execute that. Um, every live of a, of a speedy weather simulation always starts with um, an, a spectral grid object. Um, the spectral grid object is kind of like the grid object in, uh, in Notion Anagans, and because it's a spectral model, you have to define the resolution in spectral space. So this is the resolution that is often called T31. Um, so it means it has a, about like 400 kilometer resolution, so pretty, uh, fairly coarse-grained. Uh, coarse but you can specify the different grids, and we will talk a little bit more about grids uh, in the end. For example, here now we use six uh, vertical levels. You just basically define the Earth with a default radius, uh, and we, for example, here we use this uh, yeah, octahedral pix grid uh, that I will uh, specify later. But basically, the first thing you always do is you define the kind of like the physical domain, which is hard coded, it has to be a sphere. Um, but then the the discretization is the first thing, the first object you always define, um, and then. Um, in a similar way, you build, start building up all your components. So let's say one of the components you want to have, you somehow want to change the orography. The next thing you would do is that you define an orography object. And so for example, here you say like, I want to use Earth orography. There's technically even like you can specify like the file that's going to read from and so on and so forth. Um, but in the end, you just have like an object that represents your uh, orography. And you do similar things, for example, for also the Let's say, I mean, these are more like the, the, the physical parameters of your simulation, but also for like the numerical things like horizontal diffusion or some of the uh, physical parameterizations, let's say like large scale condensation, where you say like you always create these like, this is um, the, the typical scheme that is in, in the Fortran version, which are kind of used as like a starting point to, to build this model. Um, the, the very simple uh, condensa condensation scheme in there then basically can be, can be changed by just passing on some parameters. Um, but in the end, you really start building up the model from individual building blocks, um, and then you construct a model. So you definitely see some similarities there uh, to, to Ocean Anagans. Here we call this a primitive wet model. So it's the primitive equation model with humidity, so that's why it's wet. Um, and uh, yeah, you pass on the grid, you pass on all the, all the components that you do not want to have as the, as the default. Uh, and so you get this model object in the end. Um, the model object is then, because basically, uh, in general, you, may, you often end up in, this, in the situation where like, these different components of your model still have to talk to each other before you actually start the simulation. Meaning, for example, if, you define, if you're on a planet that defines a certain gravity, but some of your schemes need to use that gravity uh, component in order to pre-calculate some terms, uh, this is basically what's going to happen then in the next step, which is this initialization step. So initialize the model, then you will get uh, a simulation object back, and then you can run the simulation. And I think now I can also just do this. That should work. Up, up, up. And then basically just run through, and I uh, it continued from the previous five days. That's why the plot looks a bit different now. Um, and we just use uh, the Unicode plots here to give you a, qu a, qu a quick peek on the on the surface relative vorticity. You kind of kind of see that okay, there's some mountains, there's some like low and high pressure systems that are in the in the mid latitudes on on both um, on both hemispheres. And so this is kind of like the um, yeah this this interface that we use in order to 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 play around with speedy weather. Um, and I've found that this absolutely useful to kind of really think in terms of these like building blocks, putting the things together, constructing the model, go to the simulation, and then run the simulation. Um, and that also makes it really easy then suddenly to, which you cannot really do in a Fortran model, right? Where you're like supposed, to, you can only play in the Fortran model in the same way as like, the, or like in the way that the de developer wants you to. But here you basically just have this object simulation and you could just look afterwards at let's say the, the diagnostic variables of then the surface and then you look at the large scale precipitation in there and if you plot that one, it would be just, um, directly, even though we are on a, on a very funky grid, the, this octa helix grid, um, and still you can just like look at, um, this is just the accumulated rainfall due to large scales, so that just happens in the mid-latitudes, hence you see some signal there, um, and you can basically, exactly in the same way as like Greg defined uh, Ocean Anagans as a library, you can also basically use this here as a library because you suddenly can uh, interact with 
the, the simulation object in itself, look at the individual things. You can use the components of the model individually, so you can define different grids. In the end, this is just a grid, uh, which basically just has values defined on various grid points. And the, the model then knows it's an octahelpix grid, so it has to do some interpolation or to display it for you as a, as in terms of a matrix, because it's not a, um, it's not, it has reduced numbers of grip points towards the poles. Um, and you can, for example, still then use, like, the, let's say, the interpolate function from, uh, from, from speedy weather, which we have in a, in a sub module that's called ring grids. But basically, because suddenly everything is like agnostic of the type of grid that we have, we can just like reuse these um, operators. And we feel like this is really like giving, giving us for us in, into the direction where, yes, you have a model that has certain operators that run something, but as a user, you can use exactly the same operators again, instead of just running a Fortran model, and then you have to think about, oh, how do I actually calculate a curl on this funky grid? Uh, no, this would obviously then do this for you. Um, exactly, I'll just jump back. So what we, what I absolutely wanted to avoid uh, with this, um, and I, oh, what I absolutely wanted to avoid with this way of constructing a simulation and um, uh, building this like model from, from the bottom up is that many of these like more traditional models have these monolithic interface. So meaning as a user, you somewhere sit at the top, you can change what the developer wants you to change, meaning some kind of name list or config file. Um, and then once you then hit play, um, the model will start usually like by constructing some kind of primary components and then some secondary components and then will somehow run a simulation. But your interface to the model is really here at the top. Meaning that if you ever want to change the, the green block, which might be some scheme, so let's say, I don't know, precipitation or so, and you want to have a different pre precipitation scheme, you usually, as someone who wants to like hack around with the model, you somehow have to know what the interfaces between the green, the blue, and the yellow building block are, and you somehow have to like branch off, create copies of that, and somehow make sure that whatever parameters you throw in at the top somehow make their way actually down. And if you have this other philosophy where you kind of like, uh, where you start building the model from the bottom, you do not end up with this problem because you basically just define a new type here in green that basically then, uh, then runs upward. And so we kind of realized that this is kind of the information flow diagram for speedyweather.jl. So as a user, the first thing you always do is you create a spectral grid op object based on that you then uh, you can define all your components as you like. You can define a new planet. You can define a new atmosphere. The atmosphere usually just has like the different like gas constants, for example, in it. Um, but you can also define uh, individual components like radiation, precipitation. You can define different numerics as you want, and you kind of just basically they all need to basically have passed on then the spectral grid. But otherwise, you can construct them independently, um, and then you put them all into a model object, right? I've, I've shown you the primitive wet equation, but you can also do this with like the shallow water equations or the barotropic equations. And you kind of then have this model object, uh, which you then can initialize. Doing this initialization step, it creates the simulation object, uh, which is split into the prognostic and the diagnostic variables. And then what we really try to do is that the information always resides in the prognostic variables. Um, it then passes that on, because this is in spectral space, um, passes that on into with doing a spectral transform into the diagnostic variables, which mostly most of them sit in grid point space. You may use some of these like pre-computed stuff of the of the model, so that could, for example, be things like uh, some terms that you already had to pre-compute, um, and this is kind of like how then one time step is passed on from like go, going on from from like the first time step to the second to the third and so on and so forth. And we found, I found this really useful to um, to write this kind of information flow diagram because it really shows you like this like which should depend on what and not on which other components. Um, and uh, yeah, I've there are definitely ways where you have to somehow find. Um, kind of like ways to kind of like tweak that. So there's a lot of schemes, let's say these adaptive schemes, which for example change once the change, like the, the current, the change with the current state of your atmosphere. Those ones are obviously tricky because technically they're then diagnostic variables and they're not 
model uh, because suddenly you would have an information flow going from the diagnostic variables to, let's say, the model component that describes this adaptive scheme. So that's always a very, very tricky one, but it's very good still to know exactly when are you breaking with this, uh, with this concept. Um, and so I just, I think, yeah, at, at, as the next point, um, and as the last point, I just want to show you how you can conceptually extend this model. Um, and I think this is actually fairly similar to how you would also do it in, in Oceanadigans. So let's say, for example, we have, uh, we have this uh, abstract super type abstract condensation. So this is just like the kind of scheme that does, uh, that does the, the large scale condensation in, inside the model. And you could now define a new one by just subtyping that. You uh, may need a couple of parameters. You can define them in here. You have, for example, some pre-computed arrays. So that could be just vectors. That could be, uh, you can just initialize them with zeros. But what I find very interesting is that you can also think of this as, and this is kind of where we go back to what uh, Chris Rokaukas was talking this morning about, where you actually can think about this as just some data that sits within the scheme that, you're, uh, that you want to use. So it could be also a neural network. You may just initialize it with zeros or whatever. Um, but uh, then the second step that basically every component in, uh, in Speedy Weather has is this like initialize function. So initialize, then you pass on your, you define this for your new type my condensation, and that, for example, can then either read in the pre-trained values from your, for your neural network, or you, for example, does some computation so that you actually then end up with, um, yeah, like, for example, you want to calculate a term like, I don't know, gravity times whatever else, uh, and you kind of don't want to do this on every time step. And then the third component that every scheme needs to have is then the actual what it is supposed to do, right? So, like, your, uh, the model object has a construction, an initialization, and a simulation phase. The condensation scheme has a construction, an initialize, and, like, the actual, like, condensation function then, for example. And then you basically exactly actually tell it what it's supposed to do. And like in this simple example, you say, may say like, okay, my condensation wants to be, if my relative humidity is higher than 100%, then do something to the tendency of your, uh, of your humidity. So this, for example, would then go here where the three dots are. And if you, what I find quite um, interesting about this concept is that once you say uh, using speedy weather, you have this like, abstract condensation supertype available, and you can define this entire thing completely outside of the model, um, and then basically you do go through the same thing, but then you just define a, large -scale condens a new large-scale condensation object that's just then basically calling what you've just defined, and you can just pass that on as you did before. So it's really like a... Uh, you, yeah, an extensibility that is... Uh, you can literally just do this in a... In a, in a Jupyter notebook, as I do here. Maybe I should have used Pluto. <laughs> but this is, a, this is just in this um, yeah, Jupyter notebook, and you can see that this is kind of like, I feel like this is a nice way, and I feel it's very similar also to Ocean, Ocean Anigans does it, um, a nice way to basically have a model that is hackable, that really remains hackable. Uh, we're definitely on the performance side, not quite there yet, but um, I feel like we have some answers of this idea of like how do you create a customizable uh, model and this is where I would like to end. Thank you. Simon, question. I guess the question is, how do you decide what should be extensible and what shouldn't be? That is a very hard question, and I've debated that a lot of times, um, because there's a few things that where making something, um, or like, I call it always like abstracting it out. So you say like, you, for example, you start writing your model, and then you start writing your, let's say, time-stepping scheme. Mm. Um, and the first thing you do is you just hard-code everything. You're just like, okay, I want my uh, time-stepping scheme to be this. And you just hard code it. And you could then think like, okay, maybe I want to have this flexible in the future. And you kind of make it abstract. Um, and I feel this is something where uh, it absolutely depends on the use case of your model. Ideally, you would like to abstract them all out. But it's also a question of, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of work, right? It's a lot of work to actually do this. And so for this model, for example, I've decided to focus on these like physical parameterizations. So for example, condensation and so on to kind of have them separate because um, they have a 
relatively easy interface in the sense they're, they're all called at the beginning of every time step. Mm. And so swapping out one for the other uh, is a much easier task to do than, for example, um, being able to say, like, my time stepping should be, uh, I don't know, leapfrog, or I want to have, like, a Runga-Kutta scheme and so on. Because suddenly, if you change out, let's say, the time stepping, there's a lot, there's like an entire uh, um, chain of things that you actually need to make uh, um, flexible. And so there's a few things that, yeah, you don't want to make flexible, uh, but other parts that are relatively easy to make flexible. And so, um, yeah, there's always a trade-off, I think. There's always a trade-off, but I feel, Julia, this trade-off is like far beyond where it is with many, many of the other, other languages. Other questions? Just a comment that that question is is all over the place with uh, like you know we have talks where people are writing uh, general PDE um, you know trying to trying to write codes for general PDEs and in that in that case they're general are abstracting the dynamics away here. You know, we are doing. Uh, you, you've got a fixed, uh, um, you know, global spherical coordinate system, and some flexibility on the um, on the dynamics. So I, I'm just saying this is a big question. I go back and forth between different talks here, and people are taking very different uh, approaches to this question of what's generalizable and what's not. And I'm interested in what what you what do you think, for example, of uh, SciML's uh, attempt to, or Daedalus, uh, to build a general PDE solver. I find like, Daedalus is a really nice example because, um, I mean, they have like tons of showcases where it's very clear that it is a software package that is supposed to be used in many different fields, right? They have all these like um, astronomy applications as well as like general fluid dynamics and so on and so forth. So it's really, um, I mean, that, that is really the aim of Daedalus, right? So you, with Daedalus, you want to be able to just like quickly write in your own equations. I feel with like, uh, like an ocean or an atmosphere model, you do live within certain constraints, right? You may say like, okay, I want to solve like some weird other uh, differential equations on the sphere, fair enough. Um, but I also feel like it is not necessarily the job of an atmosphere and ocean model to always allow you all of the flexibility. In the same way you mentioned kind of like this idea of like differential equations where like you probably have like, I don't know how many, uh, like 20 different time steppers in there implement and you can just choose one. Uh, once the models get a bit more complicated, it's not necessarily, I guess, like worth the effort because many of them may not be as stable if you combine them with other schemes and so on and so forth. So there's always a trade-off and I feel like we have to be aware of where the trade-off should be, but everything else we, I feel like with Julia, we can absolutely make everything else very flexible. Yes, Carla. Um, you, you described this as like a computational research playground. I want to know where would you like to see your user PDEs go? Where do you think, like, what would be the use case for you personally to do it? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Because I feel like in the last years, I've always written models basically more for myself. And I've never really had this. Uh, I've never really had this. Um, let's say, like, large team. We have like one goal. We want to create this model in order to actually uh, create a big user base. Um, it's it is tricky. It is definitely tricky. What I would absolutely love to do personally myself, and I would love to see other people doing it, is if you like this idea of speedy is basically that you have a dynamical core. Um, and you have a bunch of different parameterizations, let's say condensation, radiation, you have all the like ocean heat fluxes and so on, and I would absolutely love people to see, um, to just implement their own versions of it. Um, so for example, just playing around with like, what's, what's gonna happen if you like, uh, if you, I don't know, if you increase the rainfall here a little bit, right? What, what does actually then happen? Or can you replace uh, a few of these components with neural networks? Can you replace all of them with neural networks? Um, Making the entire model differentiable is another thing that I would absolutely love to see, but it is definitely looks like a very hard topic, uh, not, not as easy to be done as said. 
Um, but maybe with Julia, we're actually getting, getting into that direction, right? We're gonna have another talk later on uh, differentiable models. Um, but I feel like at the moment, I would love to see people playing around with the physical parameterizations. I think that's the, that's the best, best place to currently play around with it. Yes, you wanna pass on the microphone? Oh, sorry. I'm familiar with some of the more mature weather forecasting tools like weather research forecasting. Yeah. Uh, can you compare this to weather research and forecasting in terms of intended purpose and how far along it is in terms of matching WARF's capabilities? <laughs> I think, I mean, I've never used WARF myself, um, but I mean, it's, it's also so very much supposed to be used as like a regional model, right, to really like do, do these kind of things. No, I think this is like, also like just a, the, uh, the human capacity at the moment, this is like, I think 90% me uh, writing this model. And so I feel like it's impossible to like leverage that. So you have to sometimes with some of these models, depending on like how much, uh, how much yeah, human resources you have behind it, you have to like aim for a certain niche. And I feel like here is the niche is really to like kind of like design a more like conceptual model that does something different than its a Fortran counterpart and really to show like how, how these things can be done differently. I would love to see it as like a, as like a um, yeah, as something that we can also just use, for example, in teaching, where you can simply say, I mean, this is similar to ocean shenanigans, right? You can literally like set up a simulation and a few lines of code, have it like swap out different things. And you could actually now just say like, uh, condensation equals false and like kind of, I mean, hurricane is probably a bit small for the resolutions that you can create here, but otherwise you could just take out the precipitation and the hurricane and see like what actually is different than suddenly, right? Yeah. Rough. And then we should come. If Julia really wants, as a community, play an important role in climate science in general, it seems to me that the way to go would be to have one very performant dynamical core, because we are always solving the Navier-Stokes equation, ocean yeah. and atmosphere. Then the modular part, you want the parameterization because that's where the scientific advance is actually happening. But in a sense, what I see is a proliferation of dynamical cores in, sense, in some sense that, I mean, it is useful, but then it becomes niches, sub-communities, and it's hard to see how this kind of exercise will really play against the large community models that are being run by centers around the country. Yeah, no, absolutely, I agree. Like, when it comes to the big, uh, to these like really large models with like big development teams behind it. I absolutely agree on that. That we know that the highest uncertainty comes from representing any kind of climate processes, whether it's in the ocean or in the atmosphere. Um, and so in order to kind of have, to create a model ensemble that runs a climate prediction into the future and gives you like reliable uncertainties, um, you do wanna max out the model ensemble exactly where the uncertainty comes from, meaning like all these climate processes are not necessarily the dynamic core. So technically, we should all stop what we're doing and just develop one dynamic core. I agree with that. <laughs> but I feel also we still have to produce some kind of these like prototypes in order to kind of like remind people of like, hey, actually, if you start from scratch, we can do things differently. And I feel like a lot of the I say especially like the, the models that are currently used operationally, right? So you mentioned numerical weather prediction. Um, those are sometimes a little bit stuck in their own world. And I feel like coming from Julia, we definitely have the chance to reinvent things from scratch. And I feel this is very like, and I hope this kind of like tr not triples downward, but triples upward to the big operational models. Okay, I think we should go to the next talk. Yes, of course. Please. Oh, thank you. Hi, just, just want to remind you uh, folks that the poster session is happening at 6 p.m. on the fourth floor. Okay, so the fourth floor, the, where the key and the rooms are, it's at 6 p.m. You'll also, we'll also serve appetizers. All right, thank you. Great, and the next speaker that we have is Julia, also from Klima. And uh, we heard a little bit about ocean now, we heard a little bit about ice and about atmosphere, and guess what's coming next? The coupling of the three. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Julia, the person, not the language. Uh, and today I'm gonna be talking about Klima Coupler, which is the component of this undertaking Klima, uh, which 
as Milan said, couples together these different component models that we've heard a little bit about today. So just as a brief background, I won't get too into detail about this since we've been talking about Earth system models already um, for a while now. Um, but an Earth system model is a model of our planet that typically includes multiple different uh, component models. So this could be the atmosphere, ocean, land, and the cryosphere, such as the sea ice that Skylar was talking about. Um, and we have all of these different component models, but we also want to be able to link them together in some way and um, have them really fully represent the entire planet, which consists not only of one of these components, but of all of them. Uh, so this is where the coupler comes in. So before I get into the coupler, I'm going to give a little bit more background about CLIMA. So CLIMA stands for the Climate Modeling Alliance. And this is a project that's being worked on by collaborators at Caltech, MIT, JPL, and a few other collaborating institutions. And our goal is to build a new Earth system model from scratch in Julia. Um, and there are many existing Earth system models, but a lot of these models, um, while they're very powerful, they're based on legacy code that um, was written in Fortran in as early as the 70s. Um, so we're really trying to uh, develop a new model that makes use of recent technological advancements as well as newer climate science um, to make a more accurate and performant model. So uh, here's an overview of the CLIMA structure, just to get, give you an idea of kind of how, um, kind of the scope of the project. So I'm gonna be talking about just one of the packages involved in this project, CLIMA Coupler. Uh, but there's a whole host of packages involved. Um, these, you can see some are for the atmosphere, some for the land, some for the ocean, uh, and then some utility packages as well. Um, and there are even others that aren't pictured here. So it's a pretty complicated, um, interconnected web of Julia packages that we're developing. So as I mentioned before, uh, we have these Earth system models which are made up of multiple different component models. And the role of the coupler is to connect them between each other, um, kind of to allow them to speak to each other. And there are sort of three main challenges that the coupler faces in doing this. The first one is exchanging information between the components. Um, so typically exchanging fluxes between different component models. And it also has to deal with different discretizations in space as well as time. Uh, because the component models um, aren't necessarily using the same discretizations and we have to be able to kind of reconcile these differences. So now I'm going to go into each of these challenges a little bit more in detail. Um, so the first is this exchange between component models. So here I have a diagram showing a simple atmosphere model and an ocean model and just some of the quantities that are involved with these different models. So we have some quantities that are computed internally to each of the models. So for example, we have precipitation. Um, this is a quantity that will be computed inside of the atmosphere model, but at some point this precipitation is going to move through the atmosphere and hit the surface of the ocean. And so at that point, this water, um, you can think of it as like a mass balance situation where um, this water mass is going to have to exit the atmosphere simulation and enter the ocean simulation. And so this is where the coupler comes in. It kind of handles this flux of water moving between the atmosphere and the ocean in this example. Um, there are also other quantities that are sim similar, such as um, surface temperature. This is a quantity that affects both of the component models, and we have to make sure that, it's, um, that they're kind of coordinated, um, as well as we have radiative energy flux and albedo. Um, these both play a big role at this surface between the component models. Um, we also have slightly more complicated fluxes, such as turbulent fluxes, which, rather than being computed internally to one of the models, they depend on quantities that exist in both of the models. Um, so this could depend on um, velocities of the air in the atmosphere, the water in the ocean, as well as roughness lengths of both models. So some of these fluxes become more and more complicated to calculate. And again, the role of the coupler is to make sure that both models are kind of on the same page and are exchanging this information accordingly. Uh, so the next challenge that the coupler has to um, address is uh, spatial discretization of the component models as well as regridding between the component models. So here we have two examples of cubed spheres. Um, so since our simulations are being done on the, for, the, for the globe, for the entire planet, they're done on a sphere. And to be able to do computations on the sphere, we have to discretize it uh, typically into grids. Although, um, as was mentioned before, this could be any other type of discretization, including um, like triangular grids, something like that. But um, right now we're using cubed spheres, so these are just a couple of different options. Um, each has their own pros and cons, but I won't get into the details of that right now. 
And here's a simple example um, where you can see two different meshes that two different models could have. So you could think of model one being the atmosphere and model two being the ocean, and they each have these different meshes. Um, and even though they're on different meshes, they still want to be able to communicate with each other if they're being coupled together. Um, so the red dots here are nodes where we could um, have information actually being evaluated, and these are the points where we have data that needs to be transferred between the two models. Um, so you can think about if we're moving from the coarser resolution mesh to the finer resolution mesh, we have to perform some kind of interpolation uh, to get this higher resolution data. And vice versa, in the other direction, we have to make sure that we're um, sampling the correct data points to uh, correspond to the points in space where model one is being evaluated. Now, this is kind of a simple example because the meshes are co-located with each other and um, they're also the same type of mesh. But we could have more complicated examples if um, the meshes were different types of meshes or uh, rotated with respect to each other. Um, and all of these kinds of variations make this a more and more difficult problem to solve. The next challenge faced by the coupler is uh, temporal discretization. Um, so this really only comes up in our coupler because our coupler also serves as the driver for the um, coupled system. Um, but if the coupler was separated from the driver, this would be more related to the driver, but I'm talking about it because it does come up in our coupler. Um, so the idea here is that we have multiple different models that need to be time-stepped, um, and there are different approaches for doing this. So this first diagram is showing explicit coupling. So we have an atmosphere model and an ocean model, uh, and the first thing we do is we initialize both of them. And in this approach, we first exchange information betwe between both of the models before stepping either of them. And then we step both models, and again, we exchange information, and then step again, and so on. And one advantage of this kind of approach is, um, first of all, it's pretty simple to implement compared to other time-stepping schemes. Um, it also has the ability to be concurrent, so you can step both models concurrently, or you could step them sequentially, um, but stepping them concurrently um, is faster because it's parallelized. Um, but this is not the only approach to time stepping that we have. So another option is leapfrog coupling. Uh, so this starts off similarly. We have our two models and we initialize both of them. Um, but in this approach, we uh, take, at, at the beginning of our simulation, we take our information from the ocean and we send the fluxes that we need to communicate to the atmosphere to the atmosphere first. And then we take one time step of only the atmosphere model and then we send these updated fluxes from the atmosphere to the ocean model, step the ocean model, and continue in this fashion. Uh, so a downside of this is that this can't be done concurrently because we kind of need to step them in this leapfrog pattern. Um, and so this can't be done at the same time. But an advantage is that uh, at each time step, the ocean model is getting kind of like these updated fluxes from the atmosphere. And so this prevents um, the fluxes in each of the models from diverging which is something that you can encounter with, um, say, explicit coupling if you have a very large time step. So I'm going to discuss a little bit about existing couplers and what we're hoping to achieve with our coupler. Um, so there are two main types of existing couplers in use today. The first are model-specific couplers, which are oft often written with a specific component model in mind. And because of this specificity, they can be a little bit more hard-coded um, just because they're designed with a specific model um, as the end goal. We also have these more widely used community couplers, uh, which are often very powerful and uh, very general, able to be used with different types of component models, even if these component models aren't designed with this coupler in mind. Um, and so this is a very useful trait to have. We want to be able to reuse this code over and over rather than having to redesign a different coupler for every component model that gets written. Um, so while these couplers are very powerful, one downside is that they can become very complicated internally. Um, for example, if you're connecting different component models that have uh, different functionality, different fluxes that they require, you're gonna have to keep on adding additional functionality um, to the same coupler and it can become kind of a like conglomerated huge piece of software. So the goal for our coupler is to be simple, like a model-specific coupler, but also adaptable and general, like a community coupler. So uh, since we're at JuliaCon, I'm going to get into a little bit of how Julia plays a role in this. Um, so one of the benefits of Julia that's been really helpful in our development of the coupler is multiple dispatch. Um, I'm sure this is one of our favorite features of Julia for most people here. Um, 
So the coupler has kind of a unique role in that it has to specify this interface that each of the component models must implement. Um, so we try to keep this interface as general as possible and as slim as possible, but there are a couple of functions that we just need these component models to provide. So one of these is a step function. We need to be able to step each of the component models. Um, we also have some getter methods uh, to retrieve fluxes that will need to be sent between the models. And multiple dispatch is very helpful for this because we can, uh, we can write these functions and explain that these are the interface and then new users can come in and just very easily uh, add new methods for these functions and extend them without having to change our source code at all. And um, you can see here that we have this step model sims function which steps all of the component models in our simulation. And due to multiple dispatch, this function is very simple. So all we do is we have this simple for loop that loops over all of the community, uh, sorry, all of the component models. And then we call this step function on each of them. And since each of the component models has to have this step function defined, this will just dispatch off of the type of the model and um, we'll step each of the component models. Uh, something else that Julia has been really useful for is uh, performance, both in terms of tracking performance and improving our performance. Um, I wanted to shout out a couple of packages that have been really useful for us. The first is profile.jl, which is useful for visualizing memory allocations. And the second is flamegraphs.jl, which shows um, how much time is spent in each function. And these both really allow you to kind of target where your um, code is maybe not optimized. And um, you, you can kind of further dig into those and uh, improve the code there. Uh, and we're also very happy that Julia is GPU compatible. As you heard from Greg earlier, Oceanigans is running on GPUs and they had significant speed up when they made the switch from CPU to GPU. So we're currently in the process of um, rewriting, well, not rewriting, but going through our atmosphere code and making sure that it will be GPU compatible um, with the hope of hopefully running it soon on GPUs. Um, unfortunately, we've also encountered some problems with uh, working in Julia. You know, no language can be perfect, so um, one of the issues that we face as the coupler is that we're downstream of many packages. Um, we're downstream of all of the component models as well as everything that they depend on. And so um, this can lead to longer pre-compilation as well as uh, difficulties. If any of these packages releases, um, makes a new release with any breaking changes, we have to kind of go through all of the packages that depend on that. There's a lot of um, interdependencies in our web of Klima packages. So we kind of have to go through and update all of the packages de that depend on this one that had the breaking change and make sure that everything is compatible. Um, but at some level, this is kind of inevitable when you're working on code that's still in development. So it's not necessarily a, um, something specific to Julia. Uh, and another point is that Julia is a younger language and so there's not as much developer support as we might have in some other languages. Uh, for example, we had to develop our own ODE solver package, Klima Time Steppers, um, because while we were using ordinary DiffEQ for a while, it ended up not having all of the functionality that we needed. So we're kind of extending it with this new Klima Time Steppers package. So now just a little summary to recap. Um, we have our, some of our challenges that we're um, undertaking here. For our regridding, we currently support certain mesh types and we're working on extending it to support um, even more general additional types of meshes. For our time stepping, we've implemented explicit or leapfrog schemes and soon we're gonna be working on concurrent time stepping. Uh, our interface is currently pretty sleek and slim, largely thanks to Julia's multiple dispatch, and soon we'll be testing it uh, with additional models. We hope to soon couple to Oceanigans in the coming, coming months. Um, and in terms of performance, uh, we've been able to really easily assess our performance, and we're currently working on getting our atmosphere code to run on GPUs, which will hopefully significantly speed up our code. And with that, I'd like to thank my coworkers in Klima as well as our funders, and I'll take any questions you have. I'll just say the question, has there been much research into interaction between the troposphere and higher layers of the atmosphere like thermosphere and ionosphere? Um, that's a really good question. So the question is, 
I guess you had the microphone, so I don't have to repeat it. Um, I guess uh, I don't work on the atmosphere myself. Um, I work mostly on the coupler and the land model, so I'm not exactly sure. I don't think I can answer the question. Um, you mentioned that you were initially using ODE.jl, but it was missing some functionality. What was missing? Um, yes, this is a good question. Um, Simon may know. I'm really just curious. So I think the reason for multiple things, um, it tries to do a lot of things which we don't need, um, and it doesn't, it wasn't quite as extensible as we needed it to be to do the things we wanted to do, particularly the distributed pieces, uh, to reuse data, like, you know, to minimize the amount of memory you're reusing. Um, and uh, you could get it to work, you could monkey patch it, but then everything would break when they bump versions. And then <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think, and I think, uh, I mean, well, I mentioned this as well, is that you end up using, there's a very small subset of time-stepping schemes you end up using, and you often need to do weird things, like uh, project, you know, there's often like a bunch of fixes you have to throw in there to make them, you know, stable or keep you within some fixed domain or positive preserving and positivity or something, yeah. That was the crux of it, I guess. Hi, first I just want to say that was a great talk. Um, second of all, what happens for concurrent time stepping if you have two time steps where the least common multiple is a really large time step? And how would you deal with a problem like that? Um, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, so yeah, I think you mentioned the least common multiple because the kind of the naive approach is just to run um, both models for the amount of time that is the least common multiple of their individual time steps. And it's important to note here that each component model has its own time step, and the coupler has like a separate time step um, in terms of like the number of seconds or hours or whatever you're running the model for. Um, so there are a couple of different approaches you could take here. One of them could be to, um, let's, say, let's say you have one model that runs for seven hours and one that runs for 11 hours. So the least common multiple here is pretty large, and you wouldn't really want to run your models for 77 hours independently. Um, so what you could do is run the shorter model for uh, seven hours and then do a shorter like four hour time step and then run the second one for 11 hours and then uh, reconvene kind of at that 11 hour mark. Um, but I'm sure there are other approaches that you could take as well. That's just the first one that comes to mind. I have a question on like the, let's say the general philosophy of like whether is the, do you, is the info, Kind of the does the atmosphere and the ocean do they depend on the coupler or does the coupler depend on the atmosphere and ocean, which is kind of obviously things where you have to, I mean, talk to each other as well, right? But like in the end, do you want the do you want to make the coupler so extendable that other atmospheric models can, uh, like, so that the coupler can be used also with other models, or do you want to flip the whole philosophy around and say like? This is what the coupler defines. If you want your atmospheric model to work with it, you have to follow these rules that the coupler sets. Yeah, this is a really good uh, question. This has actually been a point of discussion recently. Um, so I've been presenting about Klima Coupler, but we're also working on kind of a new and improved coupler, uh, which will be called Klima Earth. Um, and sort of, I think, the design that we've settled on, at least in this moment, is um, I mentioned before that we have our coupler and we also have the driver as part of the coupler, um, which is maybe uh, sort of a, not the approach that you need to take. It's kind of a design choice that we've made. And so because of this, the coupler is dependent on each of the component models. Um, but if we make this um, design that we're moving towards in the future, what we'll have is uh, this Klima Earth coupler that, um, prov like I said before, provides the interface for the component models. Um, the component models will depend on this Klima Earth package and extend each of these functions um, that it provides. And then we'll have uh, some kind of separate script that um, takes these functions together and actually runs them. There's been another type of Earth model that's been presented at this conference, and those are the um, Earth economic resource models that, that predict population trends, pollution, et cetera. Um, so the um, limits to growth studies from the 70s were based on those models. 
Uh, has there been much thought or effort put into coupling your high fidelity physics models from the CLIMA effort to those economic resource models from, from that other effort? That's a really interesting point. Um, I haven't heard any talks about our intentions to do this uh, in the group. Um, I think since we're still in development, we're kind of not at the stage yet where we're talking as much about um, like applications and like specifically what use cases we'll apply this to. Um, but as we get closer to having a fully working model, that could be something that we consider. What's been one of the most interesting or difficult pieces of working on the coupler? Um, Thank you for the question. That's an interesting uh, point. I think, uh, at least in terms of difficulty, one of the things that I've been working on lately is uh, taking this regridding and um, making it distributed. And so this becomes uh, uh, pretty complicated because um, we're trying to do this with MPI, um, but um, I guess it's in theory, it's not too difficult. We can kind of um, talk about how to do it and come up with a plan for it, but then once you get into the nitty gritty details, it has become um, actually a little bit uh, difficult to implement. So I would say that that's something that has taken up some of my time recently. Could you speak more about the, what I think you called the community coupler, which mm -hmm. is a, a generic uh, 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 software for if I understand it, coupling generic physics models, mm -hmm. like, and I guess I don't understand that because I would think the coupling between the atmosphere and the ocean depends on one kind of physics and geo mm. and the coupling between precipitation and the ocean is something else. Um, I, 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 maybe I'm missing what a community coupler is. Yeah, I can expand on that a little bit okay. more. So. Uh, these community couplers, even though they're still, even though they're um, like a more general type of coupler, they're still coupling between uh, component models of an Earth system model. So it would still be between uh, an atmosphere and an ocean model, or an atmosphere and a land model, something like this. Um, and part of why I mentioned that they can become very complicated, and part of the reason is because each of these component models that um, want to use this coupler might have different uh, like physical schemes that they use internally, and each of these schemes may require different fluxes that they need from the boundaries. And so you're right that this becomes a very complicated problem very quickly, where um, you can implement one coupler that works for one set of physical equations that are being used in the atmosphere, but then another model could come in that's maybe more, um, more has higher resolution dynamics that need more specific uh, quantities or something like this, um, and then you have to add in capability for that in the coupler. Amazing, thanks. Um, yeah, I think now it would be uh, great to have a little 10 minute break so that everyone gets a refreshment. So exactly. Exactly, get your refreshment and then I would say we continue in 10 minutes uh, with Sarah on uh, differentiable models.
Hello. Wonderful. Let's get to the second part of our uh, mini symposium. So to the people in the door, please come in, listen, uh, ask questions, and we'll start with the, with the second to last talk by Sarah Williamson, who's a PhD student in UT Austin at uh, U University of Texas in Austin, <laughs> this way around. And we're going to he hear a bit more about differentiable ocean models with Julia. Please. Is this one on? Do I need to switch? That is the question one. OK. So is this close enough? Hey, hi, my name is Sarah. I'm a graduate student at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I'm going to switch a little bit and talk more about kind of a method with the Earth System Models in Julia, and we're going to talk about differentiable oceans specifically. This is work that I've done as part of the DJ for Earth collaboration, which means that I have a bunch of other lovely researchers to thank for making this possible, and their names are all up here. Um, the first part of my talk will be a bit more on the mathy technical side, like the methods that we're using, and then the second half will be how we're doing this in Julia. So let's get started. So why are we interested in differentiable ocean models? Our overarching major goal is something called adjointable models, which basically means I want to do something called the adjoint method. And for adjoints, which we should think of as gradients, we need differentiable code, and this is where Julia is going to come in. The adjoint method allows for problems such as data assimilation and sensitivity analysis, or furthermore, integration with machine learning. Basically, in a neural net, you need gradients. Um, the adjoint method can help you compute those. So we'll talk a bit about First, what is the adjoint method? Overall, it can be viewed as a nifty way to compute gradients. Um, the general framework is that we define a cost function. This is any scalar valued function that depends on the model we're interested in. The second step would be to integrate the model forwards. Three is run the backwards problem. We'll talk a bit about what this means in a sec. And then the last step of the adjoint method is to compute gradients. And so how do we do this? With our predefined cost function J, we're gonna define a Lagrangian L where L is going to be the difference between my cost function and the sum over the steps that I've integrated of mu of t transpose, where here mu is my Lagrange multiplier. We can also think of mu as the adjoint variable. You might hear me use this phrase instead. Times the difference between x of t, where x is the state of my system, minus L of x of t minus delta t. L here is the, uh, it's a time step. So L is going to propagate my state x of t to x of t plus delta t. So just one step of the model. And then to find the gradient, we're going to minimize L, and going back to calculus means we take derivatives of L and we set them equal to zero. This leads to something called the adjoint equations. The first equation I have is the derivative of L with respect to my adjoint variable. Setting this equal to zero and solving for my state x of t returns to me my model equation, so this is really just the integrator. The second adjoint equation I have is the derivative of L with respect to the final state of the system. Setting this equal to zero defines for me an initial adjoint variable. Uh, I say initial loosely because this adjoint variable is technically defined the final time step. And so this is going to start for us this backwards problem. The final adjoint equation I have is a relationship between mu of t and mu of t plus delta t. And so this is going to be how we actually propagate these adjoint variables backwards in time. So this is the backwards problem of the adjoint method. I have boxed a term in equation three, and I've boxed this because this is kind of like the important gradient. So this is the derivative of my forward step with respect to my state, acting on a prior adjoint variable, or an adjoint variable one step in the future. And computing this gradient by hand is very cumbersome, and this is explicitly where automatic differentiation is going to come in. Okay. So next we can talk about a little bit of the different ways that adjoints can be used. So obviously we can always define different cost functions. For example, your cost function is any scalar valued quantity. It could be a measure of energy, for example. And this can help you answer questions such as, how would the energy at my final state change were I to change the initial conditions of my model? We can also look at cost functions that are model data misfits, and this would be for something like data assimilation. Here I have a J, which is the squared L2 norm of a state X of TK minus D of TK. X is the state as I've computed it through my model equations. D is maybe high resolution data that you've gotten through other means. Um, we can also ask different sensitivity questions with the adjoint method. So we can look at sensitivities with respect to states. This would be like a derivative of my cost function with respect to a state, and this is explicitly just my adjoint variable. So that kind of helps you get a little bit of physical meaning to these uh, kind of abstract arrays. We can also look at sensitivities with respect to model parameters. This would be like dj to d alpha for some constant alpha in the model equations. For example, how does my final state depend explicitly on this parameter alpha? Um, 
The final example I have is a combination of two and three, and this would be for parameter estimation. So let's say I have some physical system that I'm interested in, and there's a parameter in the system that I'm uncertain about, but I have a prediction. However, I also have high resolution data. I can define a cost function that's a model data misfit and use the adjoint method to compute a derivative of this cost function with respect to my uncertain parameter. And then we use this gradient in our favorite gradient-based optimization scheme to hopefully improve what we predict the parameter to be. And so this is by no means an exhaustive list. This is just a kind of a sample way that the adjoint method can be used in practice. And so there's one small hiccup in all of this. We notice that this important gradient, I've boxed it here again, this derivative of my forward step with respect to the state actually requires knowledge of the state x of t. I should put an asterisk here because if L was a linear step, then I no longer require knowledge of my state. The derivative would just be a constant. However, in most instances, L is highly nonlinear. So I'm going to need to know what x of t is to actually compute the adjoint variables. Uh, this dependence is independent of my choice of j. And for large ocean models or most Earth system models in general, storing the state at every time step just isn't possible. You'll very quickly run out of memory and you won't be able to do it. However, there is another handy way that we approach this problem. And it's with something called checkpointing. So checkpointing is kind of this workaround for the state dependence and the gradients. It does come as a trade-off. I will be using a lot less memory, so I'll be able to compute these variables, but I'm going to be doing a lot more computations. And so I have here an example with eight checkpoints. Um, so let's say I have some initial condition to my system. It's x of t naught. And I'm going to integrate my model forward. And as I integrate the model forward, I'm going to save the states x of t1, x of t2, et cetera, up until x of tf. These saved states of memory are now called my checkpoints. And once I get to the final state, I'm free to compute my initial adjoint variable because this lives at the final time. And then we can go back to the last saved checkpoint. In this case, it's x of t6. And we can reintegrate the states between x of t6 and x of tf. Okay? And so once we have those states reintegrated, we're free to backpropagate our adjoint variable to the last checkpoint at t6 throw away the states that we no longer need in memory, and then we can rinse and repeat the process moving all the way back. So at the end of the day, we'll have done the forward problem twice, but we'll have done it with the ability to compute all of these adjoint variables. Um, and so this is how we get around uh, the state dependence. And so kind of moving into the second bit of the presentation, summarizing why are we so interested in adjoints. One of the first reasons is that finite difference gradient calculations don't converge numerically. and so. The result from the adjoint method is theoretically an exact gradient. I say theoretically because there's always numerical error, but this means that it could help you with your optimization scheme to have a more accurate gradient. And then the adjoint method also really shines in instances where the model of interest is very expensive to compute alongside a high dimensional control space. What do I mean by this? I mean that my forward run is also is very computationally intensive, and the derivative that I want to compute could say be with respect to an initial condition this initial condition can live on a 100 by 100 grid, which would be theoretically 100 squared different finite difference gradient calculations that I would need to do. So in instances like this, the adjoint method will compute all of those for us simultaneously, and it really comes in handy. And then why do we want to do this with automatic differentiation? So as my model code grows and changes, my AD tool will stay the same, and there's never any need to adjust my derivative calculation. So for example, I could theoretically write down my adjoint code by hand, but as soon as I change something about the model, that little tiny change can propagate through my derivative calculation and that opens up a lot of room for error. With automa automatic differentiation, I don't need to worry about this. Okay. So why do we want to do this in Julia? So one of the first reasons, as we've seen in multiple talks on, there's a new Earth system model currently being built in Julia. This is the Klima model and I'm specifically very interested in their ocean component, oceananigans.jl. So with that being built, there's never a better time to differentiate the model. Um, Julia also has the potential to be faster than prior languages, as we've seen. Julia already contains for me two key packages for the adjoint method. We'll see what those are on the next slide. And prior packages like these were largely in Fortran. They are potentially closed source, which is not very helpful to people who want to build their own Earth system model or differentiate their own Earth system model. So the two packages that we're using for the adjoint method are enzyme.jl and checkpointing.jl. So Enzyme is an open source automatic differentiation tool, and this generates and compiles the adjoint code for us, which is really, really handy. This was developed by Moses and Shravi, and you can scan that QR code for a paper by them that goes more into depth on the package. And in general, computing the derivative of the forward step with respect to the state by hand is very cumbersome. 
Enzyme does this for us very cheaply, which is great. Um, Checkpointing.jl is a little bit confusing because the name of the package is the name of the method, but capital C is the package, lowercase c is the method. And checkpointing.jl just implements checkpointing schemes for us, and it's already doing this using Enzyme for the differentiation. So this is actually being developed explicitly for the DJ for Earth collaboration by Srihari Krishna and Michelle Shannon. You can scan the lower right QR code for our paper by Shannon at all that goes more into depth on the package itself. And so with these two, we can put it all together into a current working example. Uh, I wrote a barotropic gyre model in Julia. This is, you should think about it as just like a rectangle of fluid. There's wind flowing on the fluid. This generates circulation. There are three main unknowns in the system. It's U, V, and eta. U and V are the X and Y components of my velocity vector, respectively. Eta is the displacement from the at-rest layer of fluid that is the model. This is a fully explicit solver with RK4 time-stepping, and it was adapted from a Python model written by Milan Klova, so thank you to him. Um, and then here I have a snapshot of the X component of the velocity as I was integrating. So the sample sensitivity I'm gonna compute with uh, the adjoint method is, let's say I want to know how sensitive the spatially averaged energy at the final time is to my initial displacement field eta. My cost function is then the sum over u squared and v squared divided by the number of cells in the x direction times the number of cells in the y direction. Um, I'm gonna try to compute dj to d eta of t naught. I also note that checkpointing is needed in addition to enzymes, so even though this is by no means a full-fledged ocean model, I'm already unable to save all of my states in memory. I absolutely need to use checkpointing. Um, the model was spun up for 10 years, and the sensitivity was for a one-year integration beyond those 10 years. A uh, full working example is in Julia on the DJ for Earth repo, and then here I have a snapshot of the energy density during that one-year integration. And so what does enzyme and checkpointing give us? It gives us a nice little sensitivity video. So this is moving backwards in time, the derivative of the spatially averaged final energy to eta of t. So they're kind of, each frame is just a different adjoint field. Um, and as we move backwards in time, we see the sensitivity. So this is, uh, this is kind of the goal. And so in summary, Julia just holds a lot of potential for adjointable Earth system models. Like as we've seen, Julia holds a lot of potential for Earth system models in general. Being able to differentiate them and do sensitivity analysis or data assimilation with the adjoint method would just be an added bonus. Um, Enzyme and checkpointing are both open source Julia packages that facilitate fast and efficient generation of my adjoint code. So this is, it's really great. I don't need to write my adjoint code by hand. I get to do it with these packages that are freely available to everyone. Um, some of the next steps that we'd really like to see is one day we'd really like oceanigans.jl to work with enzyme for gradient calculations. So this would open up something like the ECHO model that's exists in Fortran. So we heard Greg Wagner talk about MIT GCM. The MIT GCM is one of the few models that actually has an adjoint model with it, and that's the ECHO project. And so we have the potential to build an adjoint model also in Julia, but with Oceanigans, and that would be a very exciting prospect. And then here is the actual sensitivity field that is like the final frame in that video. But yeah, so that's what I have, and thank you. Uh, so we're hearing about a lot of models written in other languages being yeah. rewritten in Julia. Are the users of the original models in the other languages, are they, how are they taking advantage of the Julia developments? Are they plugging in the Julia mo uh, packages into their other language codes, or are they switching to Julia? I don't think anyone is switching to Julia. Like, I don't think the MIT GCM is gonna go away. I think that people are kind of using both, uh, which I think is probably better, so you have two options. Um, and the people who wrote the MIT GCM are, I think some of them are also working on Oceanigans. I want to say Chris Hill was part of the MIT GCM build, yeah. So, I hope that answered your question. Okay. Um, great talk, by the way. Um, so with the checkpointing, I was wondering if you found like a sweet spot for like the number of time steps that you group into the checkpoint and if there's any values that are too large or too small, and oh. you know how you went about that. So that's actually a great question. So if you choose too few checkpoints, you would also end up running into issues. If you also use too many, you're gonna be doing 
a lot more work or you're saving too much in memory. Um, I did find that like the square root of the number of time steps is roughly the number of checkpoints that you want to choose. I don't have the math on me for how I found this, but that's about how I was choosing the number of checkpoints. Follow-up question, um, but that probably depends on the nonlinearity in your system, right? It so like a more turbulent system with like, like more turbulent in the same number of time steps, you would probably need to shorten the number of checkpoints, right? Is that, is that conceptually, do I understand this conceptually correct? No? I was, oh sorry. No, I, I was just looking at the size of the actual state. So like you can use Julia to compute how much memory your, the structure with the variables being checkpointed is and basing that off of how much my computer has. And that's, yeah. Yeah, it's I guess, I mean, it, it depends a bit. So if you assume each time step is kind of self-similar, right, you do the same amount of computation each time step, then really it's just... There is some math analysis that suggests some binomial kind of uh, formula is kind of what you use for kind of a hierarchy of checkpoints. That this, I think you only have one level of checkpointing there. Yeah. In the more general case, you kind of end up with hierarchies of checkpoints, and then there is some optimal thing that is based on some binomial math distribution thing. Um, so, but yeah, the actual complex, assuming each time step is kind of the same, then the complexity of the time step kind of drops out when you do that. <laughs> I don't want to no, no, it's okay. <laughs> You go first and then you go. Um, are there any difficulties with external, like if we say user sets up something that involves an external package that's not a Julia package, like is that, would you be able to handle that or is that kind of oh, too kind futuristic? Of, I feel like that's up to Enzyme. Uh, theoretically, Enzyme should work with any Julia package at least. Uh, in practice, you might run into more bugs. Yeah. Hey. Uh, yeah, nice presentation. Um, so I guess I'm one of those people that uses image GCM and its adjoint. So I'm kind of looking at a future where maybe we can use the shenanigans and its adjoint uh, for things like echo. And so my question is kind of how far along in that process are we, and Am kind I? of what's the time horizon? I guess. Uh, I think we're we're doing okay. Um. <laughs> yeah, maybe Chris Hill. So like next year. <laughs> so, um, so there are a few features in the kind of fusion of how kernel abstractions and GPUs have been used in Oceanagans that uh, Enzyme needed some work to actually be able to parse that or deal with those correctly. Um, Billy actually fixed most of that about three weeks ago, and so we're just doing some tests to see whether, uh, in which case, you know, we will have a kind of equivalent of what Sarah's doing fairly soon that is actually in Ocean Gallagher's, but it needed some bits in Enzyme to, uh, so what Sarah's example is, you know, running on CPUs and not using kind of some of the packages that we use in, in Ocean Gallagher's, so it was easier for Enzyme to work with that. One last question, maybe? Oh, okay. Um, in this morning's keynote, Chris Rakukas talked about <clears throat> how um, symbolic math is, is uh, being expressed in code and vice versa in automatic differentiation. I think your presentation had the most equations that I've seen. So I'd like to ask you, um, how do you see these developments in symbolic math and computation affecting academics and research and mathematics and computation? And do you see Julia having a, a prominent role in that? Oh my goodness. Uh, so I feel like what Chris showed when he showed the derivative code was explicitly him showing the adjoint code. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, in terms of where Julia can take this, is that what you mean? It sounds like a big new development. Oh, oh, no, no, no. I, I mean, so some, I feel like symbolic math has been around for a very long time because the ECHO project was started in like the 90s, I want to say. Um, and so the idea of the adjoint method and adjoint code in general is not a new concept. It's fairly old, actually. Uh, and what Chris was talking about with symbolic math, I feel like is just very similar ideas. 
so to speak. Uh, I hope that helped answer a little bit. I think it's pretty exciting that Julia is as fast as it is and that it has the potential to do these automatic differentiation capabilities. Like running the MIT GCM's ECHO project is a very large endeavor. Like it's in Fortran, you need to set up your model correctly and generating the adjoint code is hard. The fact that this could be like you download Oceanigans on your laptop and you could potentially differentiate it all on your laptop is very, I think it's very exciting for Julia. Amazing. Then I would say we thank Sarah again. <laughs> and go to the next talk. No, that, that was, that's the cancel one. <laughs> Just kick it a little bit. <laughs> Just check something before I go. In the right spot, yeah, in the right spot. Amazing. As the next speaker, we have uh, Gael Forger from MIT, and uh, yeah, he's been working with like Echo adjoint models, MIT GCM for quite a while, and uh, yeah, one of the few, I think, one of the earliest persons I've heard talking about Julia and how we can how we can use that already many many years ago. Uh, I think there was a, a Julia Con presentation at some point. 2018. Back, huh? 2018. 2018. Yeah, that's when that I, was, I remember that one. Um, <laughs> amazing. Exactly. And he's going to talk about climatemodels.io. Cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. And sorry I wasn't here for some of the earlier talks. I had another presentation, which gave me a, an opportunity to advertise that one. Um, so I presented uh, two today. One is the Julia for Earth Observation Workshop, which was this morning. There was a community effort. Um, and then the digital twin for ocean robots project earlier today. And so these two sort of map into that. This is the model side, whereas the observation was first and then the coupling was in between. So today I'm going to talk to you about the climate model GL package, uh, which is essentially an interface to all of the best models as much as we can. So I'm going to be much more kind of inclusive in a way than um, taking the pure Julia road. Uh, and sort of try to do something with models regardless of their language. Um, so why do that? Why not just do everything in Julia? Well, I always argue that there's a lot of you know, great and trusted models out there uh, that we have no reason to exclude and that we should continue using. Uh, these models have large communities. They are not going to jump ship tomorrow either. So I see it as a, as a 
um, kind of an inclusive effort to provide a, a general coupler or wrapper to models um, from Julia. And so one of the things I like, for example, is you know if you have MHECM on one side and then Ocean Anigans, which is sort of a, the port to Julia on the other, I want to be able to use both kind of equally uh, with the same interface. And even with pure Julia models, I would argue that sometimes it's difficult that to deal with everybody's choice of you know, APIs and, and parameter sets and all of, all of that. So what I'm providing with Climate Model GL is, is a uh, kind of a, a smoothing over that and providing a unified interface. Um, and finally, just my own motivation is you know, I want models that are written in Julia if I can, but ultimately I just want all of the models um, and I want to be able to just run them with one click of a, of a, of a mouse. So these are the goals. Let me check my time, okay. Um, here is some of those models that I'm uh, using with this and that I would refer as kind of you know, trusted, uh, widely used models. So the IPCC CMIP6 archive is one of them. This is a notebook that um, is a Pluto notebook where you can just select um, a model source and, and get its output from the web, um, then start analyzing it. Um, so there's a lot of, of those modeling efforts that have been built over time and uh, you know, are the state of the art today. Here's another, uh, which I particularly like, uh, the Hector Simple Climate Model. So this is a, a fast, sort of low-dimensional representation of those big ones we just saw, or of what, uh, say, the climate model might become um, someday. Um, and this is an image of Again, a Pluto notebook on the left and, and the type of things it generates on the right. Um, the point of this partly is to show you that you know, we can interact with all of the parameter sets for these models, regardless of their languages, through text files, which I'll talk a bit about more in a minute. And the MHGCM that's been mentioned before. So this is a differentiable uh, ocean sea ice biology atmosphere model that was indeed written in Fortran has a large community of users, and nowadays, with Climate Model GL and, and other packages called MHGCM Tool GL, you can essentially run any configuration of MHGCM from Julia with just you know, your simple interface. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about those three. These are three examples of what's in, available within the suite of models within Climate Model GL. The original presentation for this package, um, I gave a couple years ago uh, in a very brief talk, and so you can find this one on, on, on the JulaCon channel on YouTube. Um, I'm not going to repeat that, uh, what I said there, but I'm going to give you a couple of dates, um, and then go deeper into a couple of aspects that um, I think are nice. Oops, sorry for that, this is not meant to snow. Uh, so the model lineup since the 2021 presentation has increased a bit. Um, so you'll see in there that uh, some of the models we've talked about, uh, Ocean Anigan, Zector, MHDCM, uh, IPCC, CMIP6, all of the stuff is in there. Um, the left column is models that you run effectively, um, as in you, know, you start them from a point or a parameter set and you, and you compute. Um, but on the right hand side there's also uh, the other approach, which is you, the model has been run already, and all you need ultimately is to get the output and start your analysis from there. You can replay the models. And this is something that is commonly done uh, for a lot of scientific analysis. So Climate Models GL supports both of those approaches. And as you see, I have examples of a bunch in Julia, C++, Python, Fortran, uh, and then a bunch of file formats. Um, the interface is this, essentially. Uh, there is a data structure called model config. Um, here, this uh, very first block is how it works with a simple Julia function. So if your model is just a Julia function, all you end up doing is run model config, the name of that function. And the rest just uh, runs for you. Uh, I'll break it down in a minute, uh, but that's the idea of being able to run models with a click of a button, basically. What you see at the, in the bottom um, part is the macro version of this, um, so same idea. What's the printout at the end is sort of the, the, the show method for the data structure. And so as you see, there's a couple of things there. There's a, there's a folder uh, where 
basically the run method creates that folder and everything happens there. Um, there is an ID, so it's all meant to make your workflows reproducible. So you can keep track of things. Here is the version of um, slightly more explicit uh, where you define with a keyword the model. So again, this is the function climate models gel provides random worker, which is a simple Julia function for random walk as a you know as a toy example. And this just defines the data structure. Then the full expanded sequence is this. Um, we have three steps that are separate. One is setup, and the other one build, and the third one is launch. Technically, you don't always have to split up those three things, uh, but it's typically uh, how I think we achieve a lot of generality because a setup is like choosing a configuration, preparing your folders and stuff like that to, to run. There's a build step, which depending on the language happens differently. Right? In Fortran, you do a make. In Julia, you let the thing compile for you. Um, and then there's a launch method, which is like actually run the model and do your analysis. So in some cases, the build doesn't do anything. Uh, in some cases, uh, it does more. Uh, but a lot of the handling of external languages can happen there, and that makes it kind of general. Um, the setup method is the one that creates the folder structure for you. And so it does create a couple things here. Um, it creates this folder, and it puts a log subfolder in it, which is going to be Git enabled and keep track of everything you do with this uh, workflow. The random worker.csv file here is the output from the launch comment. Uh, comment. So that's the model run output, basically. So that's all there is to it. Um, here is an example where we start using this more interactively and in, in a sequence. So this has, again, the definition of the same model configuration, but now there's a parameter set with a file name and a number of time step. They are just provided as a name tuple. And then the run command is a shorthand for set up, launch, send up, build, and launch. It does all of it at once. The next set of lines is, oh, what if now I want to do another run with 200 time step? So that's what you do. You change your parameter set, the file name. The put command basically reloads the function into a channel, which means that it's going to be executed next, and then you launch. The log, command that, the log command that I'm showing here is how you probe the history of the workflow. And so this is also how each one of those lines has been added to the Git repository, essentially. So as you see here, what we did in the top is all directly reflected in the bottom. So after the fact, you know what you've done, essentially. In this case, we started one model run, we then modified the parameters, and then we run again. So to continue on the theme of the power of text files, um, the fact is they are great for a few reasons, <laughs> text files. One of them, we can read them as humans. And so that's one of the reasons that every model that um, you know, deals with humans ultimately has uh, their parameters in text files. Um, you can have them coded in, in subroutines for the defaults. Typically, you provide some kind of name list or net text file um, to define what the model run looks like. Another thing that I love about text files is they're actually Git friendly. So you can actually keep track of what changes in them as opposed to you know, notebooks. And they are standards. Uh, so the one I've chosen for climate model GL is Tomo. Uh, so essentially, the way I deal with this variety of models is I have a way to get into memory their file formats. And then I, for that I use Tomo, and I read and write to that. Um, so this leads to a notebook like this, for example, where you have exposed the internal parameters of this Hector model. You can click and change them, and then you rerun the model with another click, um, and that all gets stored into this uh, custom parameters of Tomal file. Here is another thing I love about text file, and specifically I love Pluto notebooks. So Pluto notebooks, uh, I'm sure a lot of you know, uh, they are plain text files as opposed to what Jupyter Notebooks uh, look like. They don't have plots in them, and they do have all of the dependencies for the packages. So when you're using Julia, okay, one file, the Pluto Notebook, 
text file that you can read is all you need because all of your dependencies are in there. And so that means that I can just use them with my framework immediately. So that's why I added another structure that makes every Pluto model, every Pluto notebook, a climate model GL ready to go model configuration. Looks something like this. Again, you just give the file name. In this case, the model is just the file name because it's a Pluto notebook. The name of the data structure has changed. It's Pluto config as opposed to model config, uh, but everything else is the same. And I highlighted here that the build, in this case, does nothing. And so the setup takes your Pluto file and kind of deconstructs it, put it in a folder, lets you run it with the launch method after. Another thing that I've added, because I, I don't know if anybody else has this issue, um, one downside of Pluto notebooks is I keep updating their dependencies. I, every time I change versions of Julia, and like if I wait three months, somehow they're out of whack. Um, and so I created this little update function that now lets me just get the Pluto notebook, deconstruct it, update the, the dependencies, and rewrite me a notebook. So then I can launch it. Uh, so with this way, I can streamline all of my models that I'm maintaining in the form of, you know, or distributing in the form of a, of a Pluto notebook immediately and easily programmatically. So in summary, Climate Model GLs provide a simple interface to models of all languages. Um, if you're there in Julia, that's even better. Um, Interaction with models is enacted through text files, and I'm using Tomol as a, as a standard um, platform for that. The workflow steps are recorded automatically using Git, which makes um, going over a, you know, a, a previous model experiment and understanding what's happened and, and starting a new one a lot easier in the future. So it supports uh, reproducibility. I've given you a few examples of kind of established climate models that are available already, and I've explained how any Pluto notebook is, is really really ingested in this. Um, so that's my summary, and I will just mention at the end, you know, a lot of this stuff um, you'll find either through my GitHub uh, repository directly, or I'm relying on packages that are distributed over those two organizations listed here, uh, Julia Climate and Julia Ocean. Uh, where you can um, you can browse and, and find um, some of the packages I've mentioned, um, and that's it. Thank you for your attention, and I'll take questions if you have any. I just want to kick off directly with a question that is like, um, we had a few talks now that basically. Um, more or less directly or indirectly complained about this like monolithic interface that a lot of the conventional models have because it makes them less hackable and you basically can only make the changes to the model as the developer who kind of thought about this is the monolithic interface, the nameless, the config file, whatever you want to call it, um, that I allow users to change. And so you can basically pass on anything that you can put into, into a text file. And you said that clearly that is absolutely has an advantage when you like upload it to like let's say Git as a text file. In the end, you have like everything in one one place. Um, but how does the interfacing now from climatemodels.jl to let's say these let's say MIT GCM with like name lists compared to let's say if you were to um, do the same with Ocean Anigans, where suddenly you have to basically uh, somehow interface to the entire like or like the, the the script that basically then starts constructing the the model starts uh, building the simulations on how does that differ and um, what is the implication then for 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 climate models does that make sense uh, yeah although I'm not sure I followed the whole question but the how does that differ not very much um, I mean the um, the parameter set that I need to, when I want to, you know, change something in Ocean and again, I put in a, a text file, and that's it, mm -hmm. right? Ultimately, you know, when I look at Ocean and again, um, you know, there's a lot of default parameters that are coded in text files, which are the GL files, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where you kind of find them. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of hunt for them there or in the documentation. Mm -hmm. That's similar to, you know, any other model. Um, it's the same in MHGCM, really. Um, the fact is that there is not a real explicit kind of text-based interface to defining your configurations in Ocean Anigans. Um, 
So the only difference is I have to create my own. But otherwise, it's the same principle, right? Okay. Okay. Yeah. And that one, you just then upload to, like, to make it reproducible. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Questions? Thanks, Gail. Uh, wondering about the use case here. So I imagine running some of these models could take a very long time. So you're envisioning, is the climate models JL in that use case where it takes a day or two to run a model? Or is that a case um, where you're just going to launch something in some other language and then log into Julia later on to evaluate things? Uh, I'm trying to think, what, yeah. how wide is the use case here for climate models JL? I mean, all of the above, ultimately, you know, when you run something like MHECM or Shenanigans for a long run, right, you're going to put in batch mode and you send it somewhere, uh, maybe on a compute node, right? That's what we do. Uh, that doesn't really have an impact on this, in a sense, right? You can, once you launch, that's why it's called launch, not run, in a way. It's like, you can wait for the result to happen until it does complete, right? Some things are just computationally expensive. Um, so that's one of the reasons, so I like the, the Pluto notebook, maybe that's more useful as an answer. I like the Pluto notebooks for I think that's fast, right? Pluto notebooks, they're reactive, so they're going to recompute everything every time. So if you need to, if you start your Pluto notebook and you have to wait for three days for the result to come back, you know, that's not ideal, right? But they're great for a lot of other things. Now, that's one of the reasons I'm have this created this data structure to reuse them in that way because this way you sort of streamline the thing and you separate out the steps and then just launch and then you wait as opposed to waiting in front of your screen. Is that, is that right. interesting? Yeah. Thank you. Other questions for Gail? Yeah. All right. All right. Okay, amazing. Right, then let's, let's thank uh, Gail again. Okay. Yeah, wonderful. We have a, um, a couple of minutes to spare, and I think um, there's a few things we, uh, I think I would love to, to take, like, use like the next, like, let's say 10 minutes for or so. We had a couple of talks, and I think there's definitely some of the, like, let's say, like, the, the Julia standards of what, how, do you, how do you write like big models, and I think there's, there's a lot we agree on, things like uh, using, for example, multiple dispatch in order to make things, uh, uh, to, to really make use of like extendability. Um, that is, uh, I think, basically everything that absolutely makes, where everyone agrees that absolutely makes sense. Um, there's a few of like the, the, the smaller things, like you could do like in Julia, you can do it like this way or that way, and you probably end up with like um, similar results or so. But in the end, I believe, uh, I mean, already that everything is open source, we kind of share our, uh, our efforts of like how we do things and we kind of just look into each other's like source code and like, ah, oh, this is how it's done in that model and this is how it's done in that model. Um, but I was wondering whether like people here have more opinions about like how we can uh, kind of lower this hurdle for someone who comes into uh, any kind of earth system modeling with Julia to lower this hurdle of like, this is how, this is a good practice of how to do things and whether people have some kind of opinion on that, whether we can come up with some kind of like, uh, uh, I don't know, a guidebook in whichever, whichever form that takes uh, to kind of make sure that we, yeah, we really have a space where we can also exchange these ideas of like, how do we build, uh, how do we build earth system models in Julia? Everyone gets 10, 20 seconds to digest that. <laughs> Opinions? No? You have. Of course you have. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, maybe I just want to ask you a question. Uh, I think conventions and standards are a really good idea, but how do you, I mean, it's a, this is, it has, it's going to emerge organically, right? Like, it's not going to be... No, yeah. I absolutely agree on that. So there's definitely some, um, like some kind of like how these things evolve uh, dynamically. This is always going to happen anyway, right? And like uh, one project is a bit more advanced than another, and so you basically look at the more advanced. Oh, this is how they did it. Um, but I was wondering whether there's also a form that we can somehow like document these like uh, 
I mean, I, I, like in the in the in the mini symposium title, we called it like anatomy, right? Like where we can kind of like document a little bit better, like the anatomy of our of our models, so that people can more easily understand how they're built up and how could they be like where the parts where you can exchange the heart and put another heart in, where's like the skeleton. Uh, if someone wants to build an, a similar model, how can you like uh, make sure that you have like a similar skeleton for another model so that you can just like take on uh, the heart and put it into into another one? Um, and I was just yeah, basically just wondering whether because in the end, I don't know, Speedy Weather today, for example, took some inspiration by like me talking to Greg, but also by like me logging into the into the source code of her shenanigans. Um, but I was wondering whether there's like yeah, somehow like an, another way of uh, another way of like fostering a uh, a community, a community, and that to kind of exchange all these all these efforts. Um, first, I want to say that my perspective is one of a student, um, and I think that you know climate modeling is something that's like inherently creative. So it's hard to just have like rigorous guidelines for things that you know people kind of want to be creative with and take in their own directions. But something that I think a lot about when. I, like for example, you know in your model and in Oceanigans how you create like a model object and then you have the simulation object with a time stepper. I'm sure there's a reason for that and you guys probably both like encountered like a set of mistakes that led you to make that decision. So maybe some sort of form of like common pitfalls or frequently asked questions or just mistakes that were made by previous people so that you know I don't make those mistakes when I'm trying to create my climate models would be really helpful. Yeah, I think on that, I also took inspiration from Ocean and again source code and created like the simulation model nested structure. And uh, thinking, you know, about coupling now, and as you guys are also thinking about coupling now, I could see something like Klima Earth or this sort of really easily extendable coupling framework sort of starting to set the tone for something in that form. Just that way we can hook, it would be really, really cool to have a framework that exists just to be able to hook basically any set of models developed in Julia together. I don't really have an answer, but I have like similar questions because I'm also like working on like large scale models more like um, just for like smaller problems in the atmosphere. Um, yeah, and I, um, I think there are quite a few commonalities in like the difficulties we, we've um, encountered and like the solutions we came up with. And um, yeah, one aspect that hasn't been brought up at all, but where I think it, there's also um, quite a bit of room to like um, discuss um, approaches that have worked and not worked is um, in terms of testing and validation. Um, where like yeah like how do you like do modular tests um, for like verifying the accuracy of your uh, models or like parts of your models uh, more global integration tests um, yeah, I don't know like I'm, I'm sure like, other projects have also come up with like, their ideas of how to do that and that might also be something to discuss yeah I mean absolutely I find that a very difficult topic in general because you have such a complex model it's expensive to run what do you actually, like, if you, even like if you just think about unit testing, which of the units do you actually test, right? <laughs> like some of the things only fail if you put them all together, right? So it makes it, makes it, makes it absolutely really hard. Yes, I agree with that, yeah. Um, are there any other like users of, let's say, models like Oceanadigans here that feel like there's like a certain hurdle towards, I mean, obviously tries to have the barrier as low as possible, but is there still like any kind of hurdle of like using it and understanding how you can make it more, um, how you can how you can extend these kind of models still. Actually, I may follow up on an earlier question. Um, it sounds like currently these model developments are focused on academic and research uses, which makes sense. But uh, a natural question arises. Is there an end state where you'd want these models to be used in operational forecasting, both for short-term weather, medium forecasting, and, and long-term climate? And how would you approach that? Or how would you get from here to there? Yeah, I mean, I agree. That's absolutely like a big question, right? So if you think about a, an interface like, uh, like Ocean Anning and so Speedy Weather have, um, how do you 
like an operational center, how would they set on top of that? I mean, I think in the end it's exactly the same. It's very straight, technically straightforward, but there might be a big hurdle in terms of, yeah, the existing structures in these operational centers are not, they don't think like an undergrad student thinks, right? And which we try to build the models for. Um, and so I guess, yeah, I, I don't know whether there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a big hurdle for that. No, any other? I was just gonna say in terms of um, communication, if we wanna not only have like this discussion, but maybe like kind of open a route of communication um, for this group, maybe we could um, have like a new channel on the Julia Slack or something like that for like climate model developers and users um, to kind of just like have some of this conversation and keep track of like pitfalls like we were mentioning and things like that. Okay, so when we, uh, Chris and Milan and I originally had this discussion, I think one of the things I proposed was some sort of, along those lines of a semi-regular Zoom call maybe, I don't know. We do, so I'm on the Julia HPC's chat and we once a month we have a, just like a Zoom call which is, there's a, technically an agenda but it sort of ends up being, uh, you know, whatever, some people showing off what they've been working on, some people trying to, you know, talking about a problem they had and sort of a group discussion of trying to fix things. Um, and so that was one that this was sort of one idea was maybe to have some sort of semi-regular coordinated meeting where we discussed some of these, you know, common issues. Um, but on the, to sort of answer Milan's original question, um, I think sort of there's a few things we can look for commonalities. One is sort of the very low level pieces. So, I mean, um, Skylar mentioned the sort of geometry object, <laughs> common geometry. Um, I've noticed the word mesh used a lot. Um, I actually, when we're doing Clima Core, we completely avoid, I, decided to avoid the word mesh because it was unclear what that meant. So we specifically went with grid, which is maybe not a better choice, but uh, sorry, we went with mesh, not instead of grid, sorry, the other way around. So grid, uh, but yeah, but just, um, but I ended up noticing that a lot of people tend, especially when you're trying to do things, you're trying to often use very similar constructs to yeah, do similar things, particularly uh, people who want to do things interactively. So you end up like, what is a, some sort of thing? You, know, you have something living on a domain, you know, some sort of, it's an array, but also has all this extra stuff in there, so. Uh, and we all sort of, yeah, notice a lot of commonalities there. Uh, and then the other thing is just output. So how do we sort of convert between different things, uh, you know, different spaces, diff you know, convert things to NetCDF or whatever people are formats or reading that, yeah. And so there's some other commonalities there, I think, that we could provide a good venue for. Uh, yeah, for those sort of things. Do you think, is there a scope for like more literature, like literature about software design? I don't know, um, you know, like you could write a paper, like this is how we think that you should, these are the main pieces of a, of a software for physical simulation in a high level language, for example. Um, I'm actually curious if anything like that has been done in the past, like, bef you know, for the prior generation of languages that weren't high level as well. I don't know the answer to the last question, but I almost, okay, great. I don't recall the author, but there's someone that posted on the web um, how to use Julia in scientific uh, usage, and all the details about how do you manage code? How do you keep your versions? How do you have a continuous integration? And so, those uh, from the scientific community, we don't always have all those courses, those background courses that computing uh, education has. So I was going to look into it and recommend it to my colleagues. So maybe you want to look into that. Um, just scientific uh, computing, Julia, and I think you would uh, get that uh, YouTube. Uh, Amazing, so. great. Yeah, I mean, Greg, to answer your question, I feel actually um, we're kind of at a state where we, I believe, we kind of still have to prove that actually if you follow the kind of, let's say, like the shenanigans logic, implementing that into other components, that you actually, once you put them all together, that you actually end up with a very usable climate model, which we, right, don't have yet, like a climate model that has at least ocean, atmosphere, ice, 
uh, and a bunch of other, uh, let's say, like, I don't know, land and so on in it. Um, but at least at that stage, I would absolutely recommend to just, like, write this, write this down and kind of write a, let's say, like a, almost like a high level, by, by the way, this is our philosophy behind it. When we talked a little bit about this philosophy of, like, does the coupler dictate uh, the earth and atmosphere what to do or the other way around, including sea ice. Um, and I feel like these these philosophies could absolutely go in there because I believe they have not necessarily always been documented. They may have, um, but they may have also been approached very differently. And so, uh, even if it's like let's say like a high level uh, uh, documentation paper for us that is kind of like obvious, it may actually trigger uh, a nice nice uh, uh, communication or might be a nice document to share with other people that are kind of like stuck in their Fortran world to say like, hey, this is actually how, what we can achieve by simply like changing some of these um, uh, paradigms that people usually, usually get stuck in. Yeah, any other, any other ideas on that, on this, uh, on this issue? Because otherwise I would absolutely suggest I can just take the initiative to like create the, I think I may have, did, did I do this already? I think like creating like a Julia, on the, on the Julia Slack uh, channel, I think I did that already. As a climate change, yeah, maybe you would just hijack the climate channel or something. I know this is the problem, right? Um, yeah, but maybe we can use that for like smaller, smaller discussions or so, and then definitely have something like a monthly, monthly meeting or so uh, that might be that might be good, and then just like whoever is is keen to join, just joins, and we can we can kind of like talk about specific issues of like, so people can even come with their own problem and say like, hey, this is the problem I'm currently facing. My code ends up being very, very non-linear and I don't know which, which parts are executed in which order. <laughs> Typical problem that I sometimes have. Yes, Gael. Yeah, no, uh, following up on the Slack thing, um, but also Zoom calls. So Zoom calls, like a periodic Zoom calls, I, I've said so to a few people here before, I would, you know, I would join them if Klima was kind of invading that way. Uh, as far as Slack, you know, please use GitHub instead. <laughs> like GitHub is way more full featured. It's good software. Slack is not. Slack is evanescent communication in the case of Julia because, you know, we don't want to pay the, the fees that come with having a long thread. Mm -hmm. um, huh? Yeah, there's a million of them too. That's the other issue is everybody has their preferred version of, of Slack, right? And, you know, Zulip might be better, indeed. Yeah, you know, I've, I'm on like five or six of those things already. There's something called Matrix, which is kind of nice because it's blockchain. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, GitHub is a very, very good framework and it allows for a lot of discussion space. Um, it does provide, you know, privacy if you want it, you know, et cetera. So, I, you know, in my opinion, <laughs> There's just one, but GitHub would be a much better venue for this than Slack. And people can also read it without an account. <laughs> Maybe. What? People can also read it without an account. You That's don't have to be invited true, into yeah. the group in order to read it, right? But like you could, yeah, use either use one of the existing uh, uh, GitHub organizations or like create a new one and then basically make everyone who wants to be uh, a contributor and then you can just everyone can like just like create their, their their issues or like upload like file snippets for example, link them into the issues and so on. Yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, that's definitely another another way to do that. Cool, amazing. Are there any other final comments? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So it seems to me we're still in the stage of community building when it comes to Earth System. Uh, dynamics and Julia. And so I'm um, taking a step back, not talking about ocean shenanigans or Klima or anything, about some of the barriers to entry. And in all of the discussions here today, we've heard uh, multiple dispatch uh, being put forward as you know one of the great things about Julia. I think that's because probably everybody in the room's used Julia for more than two to six months or something. And that's when, when uh, you know, you realize multiple dispatch is great. But for geoscientists that aren't as Computer science, computer science savvy. You know, Julia is a more power tool, more powerful tool than we're used to. And powerful tools are great, but you can hurt yourself with a powerful tool. And multiple dispatch, I think, falls in that category. Where composability, uh, maybe just the error messages that you get from method errors, I think they actually stop a lot of people from uptake 
uh, Julia. That, that's what I've found the biggest barrier in the beginning uh, when I was learning it, when I was beginning to uh, work with students with this language. So I think it's something worth addressing. Method not found, is it? Method not found, wow, <laughs> that kills me. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, for, for me, Julia was also the language that suddenly kind of like pulled me into the computer science world and where I was like, oh, suddenly I start understanding like some of these concepts that previously were just like weird blurry black boxes for me. Like, what does a compiler actually do? What happens on the parsing step before that? This kind of stuff, right? Multiple dispatch and so on. I've, I mean, not that I ever learned that actually in, uh, in my undergrad or so. Um, yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. There's definitely also, um, uh, it's easy for us that already have made the step to come to a computer science conference to think about concepts that are uh, in a way that um, they're like easy to understand, whereas actually mo many of our users don't necessarily want to deal with uh, what is multiple dispatch. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, I think we can uh, absolutely close the session here. I was uh, very happy to for all of you to come, for all the speakers. You can definitely thank the speakers in a second also. But before we do this, um, I think uh, we talked a little bit about having uh, dinner uh, tonight. So if anyone wants to join, we kind of thought about something like 7.30, which should be like after the, the poster presentations, and then maybe going over to the Cambridge Brewing uh, Company, CBC, which is... I don't even know where we currently are. Somewhere over there, it's like a, like a five minute walk or something. And then basically, uh, yeah, meet there at like 7.30. And probably, I guess like some of us beforehand will like, I don't know, five, 10 minutes before, we'll probably start from here walking over, um, look for familiar faces. Otherwise we see each other at 7.30 there. And uh, yeah, thanks uh, for everyone to come. Thanks for all the speakers. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you.